Yes? Good. Hi, good morning, welcome. Uh, also from my dog. Uh, welcome to my stream. Hello, Alexi. Uh, my name is Dr. Rachel Tatman. My stream channel podcast, however you're listening to this, is for anyone who cares about language, comma, technology, and other people. Uh, and today, we're going to talk about language and technology. Uh, and we're going to do that by reading some books. Books. There's only one book. There should be, wait, hold, sorry, there should be five papers, and I'm just now seeing that there are only four papers, and if you're like, Rachel, you seem tired. Correct. <laughs> yes, I am. All right. Yeah. Yes. Bias not speech recognition. Yes. Dialect, yes, yes. Uh, circulation of ethics, yes, embodiment. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, there's six. I just can't successfully count to six this morning. So this is going to be a great stream, and we're all going to have a wonderful time. Uh, so today we're going to read six papers. Um, one of them's a book. We're not going to read the whole book. Uh, in order, one, uh, this book from the handbook is ditched. <sighs> chapter from the handbook of speech perception so handbooks tend to be introductions to research topics where specific chapters are written by um, domain experts in in the field uh, and this one is on perceptual learning of accented speech by tessa bent and melissa bays burke um, i don't know if i've ever met tessa in person but uh i have have had a chance to hang out with melissa a couple times and she's fabulous uh, and then we are going to read an applied linguistics paper, Bias and Automatic Speech Recognition, The Case of African American Language by Joshua L. Martin and Kelly Elizabeth Wright. And uh, we've got two archive papers. So you may have noticed, hey Tom, uh, you may have noticed that there's now little icons on the YouTube thumbnail and the, uh, the ones that look like browser tabs are journal articles. The ones that look like the archive logo are archive articles, right? So they haven't, to my knowledge, been published. The ones that are a book are a book, and the one that's like the motorboard, the hat you wear when you graduate, that's me moving the tassel from side to side, uh, are dissertations or theses. So we've got two journal articles, two um, pre-pub pre -pub things, non-preprints from archive, uh, one book and one thesis. Uh, so the second journal article was, again, this bias in ASR, uh, focusing on African American language, uh, which I wonder if they're going to just talk about English, or they're also going to talk about, I don't know what the other things they might talk about are with language there. Maybe this is one of those things where uh, they're really buying into the creolization hypothesis, so they, they don't want to necessarily call... Um, but I would probably call African American language. Um, they probably they might not want to call it English because they've they're really thinking that it's a creole of of English and some other languages, um, which me maybe maybe not right. That's not a field that I'm super in, so I'm not I don't have strong opinions on that. Uh, and then we've got another <laughs> uh, dialect related thing. Uh, so this is a preprint dialect robust evaluation of generated text. Uh, and this one is not in my field at all. I, I don't have a background in computer vision, so um, those of you who do are probably going to have to help me out on this one. Uh, oh, I didn't actually read the authors for that previous one. Dialect Robust Evaluation of Generated Text by uh, Jiao Soon, probably. Thibault uh, Salem, Elizabeth Clark, Tu Vu, Timothy Dozat, Dan Garrett, uh, Aditya Sedant, Sedant? Uh, Jacob Eisenstein and Sebastian German. Uh, and then digital art or digital forgery, uh, investigating data replic replication and diffusion models. So um, this was shared by Mark R. He's at Georgia. He works on um, generative art and stuff. Um, narrative generation, I think, is his, his particular research area. Uh, anyway, he shared this and it's uh, talking about potentially some examples of things that are parallel to the work that's been done finding memorization, even from single data points in large language models on uh, diffusion models for image generation, um, which I think is important given the ongoing discussion of uh, potential copyright infringement by these models. Uh, and this one is by uh, Gothami Sampali. 
Vasu Singla, uh, Micah Goldblum, 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 uh, Jonas, Jonas, Gipening, Gipping, uh, and Tom Goldstein. Apologies. <laughs> Just blanket apology to everyone whose name I say wrong. Um, sorry about it. And the ones that I confidently say right on the first time are probably uh, people I know, <laughs> where I'm pretty sure I know how to say their name, like uh, like Melissa. Uh, and then uh, a chapter from this book that just came out, uh, Economies of Virtue, the Circulation of Quote Ethics in AI, uh, edited by uh, Thao Fan, Jake, uh, Jake Golden Fien, uh, Declan, sorry, Declan, Kutch, Cooch, and Monique Mann, uh, which is in the Theory on Demand series. Uh, and there is doo -doo -doo -doo, a particular chapter I was going to um, read from here that I kept getting recommended to me by various folks. And it was. Da -da -da -da. Uh, there was an article there was an interview with or they were talking to uh meredith whitaker right so this this open secrets uh section is the one that i was planning on reading so let me just scroll to there uh because as you can see this is you know 200 pages uh i'm not gonna read the whole thing here online uh i love you all but no uh where is the first page of this it said it was on 147 right no, they're talking to Meredith. Okay, 140. Uh, so Open Secrets, an interview with Meredith Whitaker, who I believe is currently CEO of Signal. Uh, let me double check that before I say wrong things. Meredith Whitaker. The ability to have components below the lexical level. Um, so this is hitting on, this thesis in particular hits on a lot of themes that I thought about a lot in my graduate work. Oh. Mm. Okay. Uh, hopefully you all caught that. Uh, Uh, hopefully we're still in the same stream. Let me double check because it dropped for just a second, which was uh, scary. Ugh. It's not making the sorts of connected e. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. It says I'm back. Fingers crossed. The stream doesn't drop again. Uh, but I was going to say this dissertation pulls together a lot of themes that I was thinking about a lot in my, my dissertation work that I and work around my dissertation that didn't make it into my dissertation uh, that I've talked about a couple times on the channel before. So in particular, I worked on signed languages. I was really interested in um, how uh, gestures become linguistic in nature, right? Um, and particularly sublexical components. So lex lexical at the word level sub below that um, so in um, uh, spoken language that might be phonemes that might be things like tones uh, whereas in sign language those would be parameters um, and one of the things I did in, in grad school was I did a huge you know meta review of different studies and grammars of sign languages trying to figure out all of the different parameters that were tested in all of these different sign languages so how are people um, using uh, the body to encode grammatical information and what are what are the tools that are being used to, you know, index meaning. Uh, anyway, so I'm very excited from this and this is from UBC up in uh, Victoria. Nope. The big one, Vancouver. Good morning. <laughs> So let's hop in. Uh, and I'll say, first off, we've got this um, uh, handbook. Oh, uh, Lynn has a chapter as well, and Cynthia. Anyway, so these are a bunch of folks that I, I whose work I am very familiar with because I worked in perceptual learning, uh, and my dissertation was on perceptual learning for humans and also for um, computers, right? So I was studying human learning to help uh, develop a more human-like uh, machine learning application, basically. 
uh, docking. There's been a couple hiccups and it's going good now. Oh, good. Uh, and hello, Ethic here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, hey, Robbie. Uh, and I will say, <laughs> a single chapter of this is 42 uh, US dollars, and the whole book is, I think, 153, $156, excuse me, the ebook. Um, so we're just going to read the excerpts of it that are available on Google Books, and if you are interested, you can go um, order a copy through a library, ask a library to buy it. Uh, don't, don't buy it with your own money, unless you really, really care about it, right? Uh, Academic books are very expensive. And you might be like, well, it's because all the academics are getting paid. Nah. <laughs> the academics work for free. Uh, the the pay is going directly to the publishers. Uh, and I know that because I've had uh, chapters in, in similar volumes. You don't get paid. Uh, so perceptual learning of accented speech. Uh, and I will say, so just quick background. Actually, they'll probably talk about it. Uh, I was gonna talk about the difference between dialect and accent. Usually accent is uh, a non-native speaker's variety, whereas dialect is a native speaker's variety, right? So I speak a dialect of English and accented French, um, for example. Uh, research, Robbie says, did I do research in a team or as an individual? I did both. Yeah. Uh, generally in linguistics dissertations tend to be primarily individual research, but I also worked on, on a couple of uh, papers with various co-authors. Uh, yeah. So just hopping in, reading the first couple paragraphs. Individuals who are speaking in a second language or, you know, third, fourth, nth, uh, tend to use a language in a way that differs from native speakers. These non-native speakers may differ from native speakers in all areas of language, including pronunciation, word usage, sentence structure, and social language use. The specific ways in which non-native speakers diverge from native norms will be shaped by the specific properties of uh, their native language so that speakers from a specific first language, L1, and second language, L2, pairing will tend to have shared patterns of usage in the L2. Um, one thing that is particularly interesting, um, Tom says, because other only other academics are reading the books mostly. I mean, that's true, yeah. Generally, research is written for an audience of researchers. We've talked on the channel about how research is a, a social activity. Um, yes, it is definitely, definitely specialized, I would say. But also, uh, publishers like money. <laughs> And uh, they would like more of it. And uh, yeah, there's, it's, it's not the greatest in terms of, you know, access to information. Actually, can I make this bigger? Is this gonna go full screen? Ah, there we go. Okay, that's easier to look at. Um, there is another uh, wrinkle here, right? Which is the individual variability in L2 speakers tends to be greater than individual variability in L1 speakers, uh, because in addition to the effects of L1 and L2, you also have, um, you know, not everyone learns every part of a language equally well, right? So for example, I have, you know, I can pick up on pronunciation of non-tonal languages pretty well. Uh, so like I can say words that sound okay if I've had enough repetitions of it. Um, but uh, word learning is for me extremely difficult and writing is usually the thing that makes me fail language classes. <laughs> um, again, dyslexic, it's one of those places where I just struggle much more than other people. Um, based on uh, past experiences, which is one of the reasons that I really liked ASL, American Sign Language, as a second language, uh, because it doesn't have a writing system. It does have a manual alphabet that is drawn from the Latin alphabet that I grew up learning. So, yeah. Hello, Henry. Happy holiday. Yes, I believe today is Hanukkah. The second day of Hanukkah. <laughs> um, so, happy, happy Hanukkah if you're celebrating, and there's probably other holidays happening uh, today. I know there's a bunch tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, so there tends to be more variation in, in L2 speakers of a given language, more individual variation, um, because you also have that, you know, additional language learning process and not everyone is going to do things in the same way. In terms of pronunciation or sound structure, the production of specific sound, contrasts, phonemes will be influenced by the relationship between the phoneme systems in the speaker's first and second languages. So uh, we talked about the fricatives of Mandarin a while ago. Mandarin has some fricatives that English doesn't have. English has some fricatives that Mandarin does have. Um, we both have fricatives the other language don't have, uh, and the the challenge there is that a lot of times English speakers will map the wrong fricative that they have onto a an onto a Mandarin fricative, um, 
as an example, right? Or a lot of languages don't have the th or th sound, a tha, a tha. Um, Interdental fricative that we have in English, it's in words like this, that, these, those, them, their, etc. cetera, uh, nether for, for an inter, um, intervocalic one. Um, pretty rare cross-linguistically, a lot of non-native speakers of English particularly struggle with it and will probably borrow a sound from their native language. So um, uh, stereotypically, French speakers will use a Z, right? So like, zay, <laughs> zay, um, and, uh, you know, uh, other languages will use a D sound. So, you know, dis, dat, um, Again, it's sort of stereotypically, but they'll they'll pick a sound that sounds similar to them from their their first language if they're uh, just learning it. Uh, Alexi says, "Does my con did condition affect me differently with different writing systems?" Um, good question. I have pretty good phonological understanding, so I'm pretty good at taking a word and breaking it down into its constituent sounds. Uh, so the less relationship there is between a writing system and a sound system, the harder it is for me to learn. Um, so. If assuming this is spoken language, so English was very difficult. Also, my the first second language I studied French, also pretty difficult. The French writing system was codified before a bunch of linguistic changes, so it represents um, sort of the surface form looks a lot more like earlier versions of French, which is why uh, there's a lot more letters than vowels. Uh, there's been some appenthesis that's gone on historically in French, um, and uh, trying to learn Chinese characters is one of the worst academic experiences I've ever had in my life. It was horrible. There's so many things that you can rotate and flip and put on the wrong side and mirror. And, you know, it's just, it's a bad time for me in particular. <laughs> um, so yes, the, the less phonologically motivated a writing system is, the worse. Uh, Uthiger says, my, my kids complain about French for the same reason. So many silent letters. Yeah. I mean, they didn't used to be silent, right? Just like, um, you know, uh, things like the cruster in English that we lost. It didn't used to be a silent K, right? It used to be pronounced K. Uh, yes. Writing systems. Anyway. So that's on the production side, right? Uh, but what about the perception side, right? Like what you're actually hearing and how you are learning to understand. Uh, in this case, I'm assuming they're gonna, knowing Melissa's work, they're gonna be talking about native speakers learning to understand accented speech, um, which is something that everyone can do, right? Like you can learn to understand somebody speaking a particular accent with fairly little exposure, uh, particularly if you have like an additional port source of information during the interactions, right? Like it's happening face to face, that'll be a little bit easier. Um, I think actually Melissa's work has looked at that, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tom says French has uh, many to one letter to sound orthography. Yes, uh, as does as does English, particularly with um, schwa is that vowel sound that's like uh, uh, that occurs a lot in English, uh, occurs right in there. Uh, it could be represented by pretty much any vowel letter. Screw you. <laughs> I'm sorry for any of you who've had to learn English writing as an adult. Uh, Alexi says, I learned my English uh, for and from scientific papers and technical documents and texts. People would be published with me using fancy science words at the same time being uh, very uh, bad at normal communication. Yeah, that's definitely another thing, right? Um, domain effects in your language learning. Like, I know a lot of signs for, say, uh, linguistic principles, or I did at one point, my, my signing has gotten a lot bad, a lot worse over time, um, right? And I, you know, a lot of the French vocabulary that I do know is around linguistics. Um, could I, like, go to someone's house and make chit-chat? No. <laughs> Maybe in ASL, probably not in, uh, in French. Uh, Nick says, hi, Rachel, saw your Kaggle video, and it was really helpful, so thank you for your work. Oh, thank you. Huh. Uh, Robbie says, is NLP computer science plus linguistics? It was at some point in the past. Um, the expectation that you know anything about linguistics has sort of drained away over time, but certainly historically, most com computational linguists did have a background in linguistics as well. Uh, English, Tom says, English is many to many. <laughs> Uh, Alexi says, maybe Korean Hangul might be interesting for you. Yes, if I was, if I, you know, was forced to learn a writing system, uh, Hangul probably is the one that I would pick because it is so um, phonetically transparent. Uh, Tom says, I like reading papers by French people. Yeah, there's a certain um, quality in French academic writing uh, that's 
a little bit more poetic. I don't know. I think in contrast, English academic writing tends to be a little bit more blunt. Um, that can be can be nice. So Sir, the I mentioned sort of one of the the early people in the modern tradition of linguists, I would say structuralists, um, was was French. So a lot of um, early linguistics literature drew from the French. Yep. <laughs> Tom says, uh, a hyperplane to be like an aeroplane. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, Alexi says, still learning fun funny English words. The last one, switcheroo. Yeah. Um, that might be more of an American thing than uh, uh, anything else, possibly. Anyway, so how do you, how do people learn to understand accented speech for specific L2? Um, yeah, from a listener's perspective, uh, these divergences from native norms present in non-native accented speech can be challenging for accurate word recognition because these differences will diverge from the majority of previously experienced pronunciations of words. However, the systematicity in speech produced by non-native speakers also presents an opportunity for listeners to tune into the structure underlying these unfamiliar pronunciations. Thus, investigating the perception of non-native speech gives linguists and psychologists opportunities to examine the plasticity of our perceptual systems, right? Um, and perceptual learning is something that you can do with any of your senses, right? With enough, um, you know, with enough exposure. So some of the classic examples are uh, a really well-trained sommelier, like a wine person, can not only, you know, tell you, oh, what type of wine it is, maybe where it's from, but will be able to tell you if a glass was poured from the top or bottom of the bottle, just because they've had so many examples of different, um, of different things that they've, you know, created a model of that perceptual space and can tune into very subtle distinctions that someone who hasn't had a lot of examples wouldn't be able to do. Um, another classic example from the perceptual learning literature is um, there's this process called sexing chickens, uh, which is where you take a chick that is hatched and you figure out whether it's a, a male or a female. Is it a hen or a rooster? Backwards. Roosters are the males, hens are the females. Um, and generally this is if somebody orders some chickens to be mailed to them to start a laying flock, um, they want mostly hens. Uh, so determining whether or not you have a hen or a rooster uh, is very helpful for figuring out whether or not you're sending people a bunch of hens or not. Um, also, I don't know how it's done elsewhere in the world, but in the U.S., generally you'll, you know, you order chickens uh, and they come to you through the mail in like a box with holes in it. Um, that's just how you get chickens. <laughs> uh, and usually they are the chicks, right? Um, so that that's how you get chickens in the US. I don't know if y'all do that. Sort of a, a fun farm fact for you from, from my childhood. Uh, Alexi says, I don't fully understand what switcheroo means though. Oh, so a switcheroo is um, a sort of informal colloquial term for taking two things and changing their positions with each other, right? So um, it might be, if you know the scene from one of the Indiana Jones movies where he has like a golden idol and a bag of sand uh, and he places the bag of sand down for the golden idol, that would be like a switcheroo. Um, or if you had, you know, two twins and they were trying to pose as each other uh, and they swapped places, that would be a switcheroo. Yeah, hopefully that's clear. Sometimes people say that they pulled a switcheroo. Yeah. Alexi says, mail order chickens. Yep. Uh, hey, two prototype, welcome. Uh, similarly, uh, bees, you get bees in the mail. Uh, anyway, and then we were missing some, uh, some text, uh, but just to summarize what I'm sure they're talking about there, a growing body of work suggests that listeners can adapt to non-native speech after both short, long, and short-term exposure to these speech varieties. And this is the thing that really gets me about, what was that speech startup? I think they got more money than any other speech startup previously, which just made me sad, where um, they're trying to do like a voice changer to make people's speech unaccented. Uh, everyone has a, a dialect or an accent, um, when you can teach people to understand accented speech pretty quickly, um, right? Like it's, it's a pretty fast perceptual learning process, particularly if it's a variety they've been ambiently exposed to before. Um, and yeah, very doable. Anyway, 
Uh, listeners' ability to more accurately identify target words produced by non-native speakers involved multiple types of changes in how acoustic phonetic information is interpreted in its relation to segmental category mapping. Basically, what you hear and how you map that to a particular segment in your your phoneme inventory, right? Um, so with using that example, that sort of stereotypical example that French speakers will say, you know, this, uh, Z instead of th, you can learn that mapping. Oh, z is th. They meant this, right? Very easy to do, particularly if you've had quite a bit of exposure to the the dialect. Uh, these changes may involve shifting category boundaries, remapping, so that's what I was talking about, general expansion, cue reweighting, and novel cue learning. Cues are subphonemic, um, usually acoustic properties that you will use to identify things, right? So like the first format, for example, would be a cue. Uh, first in category boundary shifts, and then they're talking about all those different types of ways that people can learn. Um, and uh, I think this is probably the most relevant for y'all, because I know many of you are not particularly uh, uh, I know many of you are second or third or fourth or fifth language English speakers, so. Uh, T prototype says, I think someone said a linguistically focused series might be soon. Yeah, it definitely will not be this month. <laughs> I am so tired. <laughs> I got a lot going on. Uh, yes, but it is something I want to do. And I've just been thinking about when we are chatting and uh, during stream, I'm really enjoying talking about linguistics more. So I do think I want to add a little bit more in. Um, and I think it's also very relevant, right? Particularly for those of you who are working on languages that are not English and you're being you know, I'm sure you were interacting with tools that were primarily identified, you know, trained on and for English users to work on English, because um, that's just sort of the state of the field right now. Uh, and I think it can be really helpful to have a linguistic perspective in those situations because it'll help you, um, you know, understand what's going on. For example, why you shouldn't remove capitalization in German. Sorry, they did that in the whisper paper and I'm still upset about it. Um, the whiskey paper made a lot of decisions that I would say were not linguistically motivated. Let me put it that way. Anyway, uh, so this is looking at non-ESL teachers, so English as a second language teachers. Um, so, and it's a, a meta study, it's a, a book chapter will not present original research, it will sort of review existing research. Uh, Rubin and Smith, 1990, found that undergraduate students' scores on a closed test of non-native speech were positively correlated with the number of courses the students had taken with international teaching assistance. Similar to the possible confounds with ESL's teachers, students who opt to take courses with international instructors may hold more positive views of non-native speakers than those who avoid the instructors. Uh, so a closed test is like, um, like a fill in the blank. I'm gonna double check that because I'm suddenly, uh, Da, 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 da. Yes, a procedure where a subject is asked to supply words that have been removed from a passage of text as their ability to comprehend text. Um, so basically how Bert was trained. Uh, uh, Alexi says there was an app called Elsa or something. I tried it a bit to fix my pronunciation. Yeah, I mean, I'm not super familiar with the world of, you know, English pronunciation apps because uh, I... My, I'm bi-dialectal. I have a much more sort of like professional, neutral, uh, neutrally judged by folks dialects. And then I have um, my home dialect, which is, it's showing up one more on stream. I'd say I have it now, particularly when I'm particularly tired, uh, but it is Southern American English. Um, so English from the Southeast of the United States. And it is, um, it is a dialect that a lot of people have intentionally trained themselves not to have anymore because it tends to be associated with very negative value judgments, right? Um, particularly uh, value judgments of ignorance, um, stupidity, um, lack of expertise, um, etc. cetera. <laughs> uh, it is also of the varieties of English in the United States, the one that has the most overlap with African-American English, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So because there's lots of black folks in the South. That may be surprising news to you if you're not super familiar with the history of the US, but if you are, it should not be. Um, so definitely people in my position have trained themselves 
to have a different accent or dialect, um, but it's not something that I have ever consciously chosen to do. Um, so you know they're saying, uh, you know, the more courses you take with uh, on international TAs, the more um, able you are to correctly understand what they're saying. Uh, Whitman Weber and McQueen, I think that's probably Robin McQueen, who, uh, she's at Wisconsin, I think. She also does uh, sheepdog trials. Uh, she's a very good uh, sheepdog trainer. Circumve that was not relevant at all. <laughs> just, it's been a while since I thought about her. Uh, circumvented these possible confounds by recruiting native Dutch listeners who lived in different cities in the Netherlands, one with a relatively large German population and the other with few German speakers. In a cross-modal priming paradigm, so that means that cross-modal probably in this case, uh, visual and acoustic uh, priming. You are shown a piece of information that is related to something that you're trying to get you to do, right? So I may prime you to think about uh, milk by showing you a picture of a cow, or I may prime you to think about milk by saying something like silk, ilk, filk. <laughs> uh, there's a rare lexical item, especially these days. Um, uh, which would be a phonological prime, right? Things that sound similar or semantic prime, things that have a similar meaning. Uh, with German accented primes varying in accent strengths, both groups were primed by weakly and moderately accented primes, but only the listeners with more naturalistic experience with German accented Dutch were primed by the strongly accented primes. Um, and basically, if something primes something else, that is evidence that those two things have some sort of perceptual cognitive relation to each other. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, based building on the work of Whitman Weber and McQueen, Peretta Tucker and uh, Jarvikovy. It's probably probably Ben Tucker uh, measured how self-reported gradient experience with Chinese accented English influenced the perception of talkers with a range of accent strengths. Um, the influence of both accent strength and listener experience on accuracy and processing speed were gradient and nonlinear. Oh, interesting. Uh, listeners with more experience could handle pronunciation variants, quote, at the fringes of what would be considered native-like. That is, listeners with experience of Chinese accented English processed mildly accented tokens in a similar way to native tokens, but even these mildly accented tokens caused processing difficulties for listeners without experience. Listeners with more experience also had an advantage for moderately accented tokens, whereas listeners regardless of extent of experience, showed weaker facilitation for heavily accented tokens. Interesting. So basically what they're saying here is if you've had experience, you will treat uh, of this particular accent, you will treat, you know, things without a super strong accent the same as you would productions by a native speaker. Um, for moderately accented ones, experience matters even more. And for very, very heavily accented uh, tokens, um, you're going to not get as much as much benefit. So, Alexi says, I think international English is a good thing. Uh, I noticed that English native speakers who interact with international people tend to speak using simpler structures, limiting their vocabulary, etc. Yeah, definitely. You also hear um, discussions of world English, um, which is, is sort of similar, right? Um, yeah, and I definitely agree that it's... Uh, I know that I speak quickly, and I also tend to use a lot of um, regional dialect features, both in pronunciation and word choice, that may be uh, uh, more challenging for non-native speakers, um, which is why I have auto captions on, which have been working pretty well, and also why I caption by hand all of my uh, recorded content, which I should have something coming up soon. Oh, <laughs> I gotta finish the captions. Uh, it takes so long, but I think it's worth it. All right. Uh, and then uh, discussions of bilingual listeners, so listeners who speak more than one language. Um, da da da. Uh, uh, uh. I'm just sort of skimming here. Uh, oh, <laughs> treat pronounced trit is what that says. Uh, trick pronounced treak. A perception of genuinely accented words and arbitrarily accented words. The genuinely accented pronunciations facilitated recognition of the targets for all three groups of listeners, whereas the arbitrarily accented words facilitated recognition only for the bilingual listeners. Interesting. So that here they're doing like a, 
an accented modification that no one who actually had the accent would say, right? They're basically making up something. Um, and if the speakers are bilingual, then uh, even the fake accent is helpful for them. But if they only have sort of perceptual experience of the second language, it doesn't seem like it helps. Interesting. Uh, results from a second study support the interpretation that bilingual listeners have greater perceptual flexibility. So if you speak multiple languages, you're, you're willing to take in, uh, to accept a greater variety of pronunciations as arbitrarily accented forms from facilitated targets, from facilitated as arbitrarily accented forms facilitated target recognition for bilingual listeners in our first language, but not for monolingual listeners. Okay, so these, the fake accented words, helpful for bilinguals, not for monolinguals, perhaps people who are mono just had a lot of experience with uh, accented speech, but I would guess that the more experience that you've had, uh, the the more robust the plasticity of your perceptual system as well. Which also, we know that, you know, long-term cognitive plasticity has really good impacts on, you know, mental health and, you know, cognition, especially as you age. So if you are someone who is monolingual and doesn't listen to a lot of accented speech, maybe listen to some accented speech or, you know, watch movies with subtitles on, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Uh, Alexi says it's like simple English on Wikipedia. Very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, you know, a good thing. All right. Uh, so basically they're saying, hey, if you have a lot of experience with a non-native accent over a lot of time, even if it's just sort of like generally around you and you're not specifically trying to learn it, you're going to pick up on more ability to understand and handle a uh, variation like that. Uh, and then short-term adaptation, this is what I was talking about, is that people can pick up on this perceptual learning, particularly at the phone level, the phoneme level, the, the sound level, very, very quickly, like at as many as one or two exposures, right? That's what I found in, in my dissertation work. Uh, and to be fair, I was looking at native speakers of New Zealand English, so this is a dialect difference and not an accent difference, but still. Uh, Yes. A range of studies have provided listeners with laboratory experience to test whether and how their ability to understand non-native speech accurately and quickly can be enhanced. Um, there's explicit training where listeners are given instruction, and then there's an implicit training where they're given exposure. Uh, in implicit approaches, it is assumed that listeners learn from how non-native samples systematically diverge from the native standard, but they may not have explicit metalinguistic awareness about the acoustic phonetic features of native accents. So metalinguistic awareness, knowing about a language, Explicit, you know that you have it. Uh, yeah. Uh, whether explicit training in acoustic phonetic characteristics of an accent or cross-cultural training can improve a listener's ability to understand non-native speakers have received mixed support. Oh, is there some suggestion that it doesn't help? Interesting. Uh, in Dury, Grossiter, and Murnau, 2002, cross-cultural training alone or combined with training on the specific characteristics of a non-native accent, Vietnamese-accented English in this case, did not improve listeners' passage comprehension or sentence recognition above performance games shown for a control group who did not receive any training. Interesting. Cross-cultural, so I, but this is explicit, right? So specifically telling people things did not seem to help. Uh, however, there was an improvement for some affective measures. See uh, Villarreal 2013 for similar null result. Oh, Dan. Oh, Dan, you got cited. Uh, sorry, I know a lot of these people uh, personally because I, I worked in this this sub 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 field. Um, however, more recent work has demonstrated that under certain conditions, explicit training about how non-native talkers' production patterns differ from native patterns can improve listeners' abilities to transcribe non-native accented speech sentences, non-native accented sentences. Um, okay, so sometimes it can help to get that implicit instruction, sorry, explicit instruction, be told stuff. Uh, they hypothesized that a positive result compared to earlier work may have resulted from the inclusion of learning assessments regarding whether the participants retained the content from the explicit training. Interesting. So if they had like a little test to be like, did you pay attention? Uh, it seems to have changed the, the outcome. 
Participants were given a comprehension post-test only after they had de demonstrated learning of the content of the explicit training, which is based on multiple choice quiz. It is possible that earlier studies were less successful, not because of this type of training cannot effectively improve recognition of non-native accented words, but because the participants did not absorb enough of the information during training to facilitate their accent understanding of non-native speech. Interesting. Particularly if they're using undergraduates, I can see that. And also particularly if it's not instrumental for them, right? Actually, what's that gonna be right there? My dog got off the warm blanket, so I'm getting it for me because I'm quite chilly. Um, and by what I mean by that is people don't tend to learn and retain languages just for fun. Some people do, I'm sure some of you watching do, but generally when someone learns a language, it's for a specific purpose um, and their ability to retain and improve learning that language long-term is really how useful that purpose is for them, right? So if you're talking to someone specific, um, probably you're going to uh, have better long-term results than if you're just like, it would be nice to know Welsh. I'm gonna learn Welsh. If you live in Wales and you're talking to Welsh people, you know, consistently, that's gonna be, you're gonna have more motivation, right? Um, so it could just be like, people didn't want to pay attention. <laughs> uh, yes, and then uh, implicit training, and this is the what I was more familiar with. Most implicit training studies have found that providing listeners with exposure to non-native accented speech can increase quick and accurate understanding of non-native speech. Um, so basically, the more that you get a chance to hear a specific accent, particularly if you have information, access to a lot of information that helps you understand it, um, or, you know, anchor the information that you're trying to get from, from that speech output, uh, the more likely you are to have a good time <laughs> and learn that accent pretty quickly. Um, anyway, and then a bunch of different, a bunch of different studies. Uh, but I think the, you know, and then they're talking about the specific learning processes and what they, they look like, uh, how it can happen over time. Um, and then, you know, linguistic theory, uh, which I don't want to get super duper deep in, but the, uh, you know, the general point here is that you can learn to understand an accent that you are unfamiliar with, a non-native accent, um, and just sort of exposure to those accents help. So if you were to say, develop a startup and get a bunch of money to make sure that people are never exposed to specific accents, um, that would actually be harmful for the long-term perceptual learning of those people, period. Anyway, <laughs> enough uh, dunking on um, that company. Next paper. Uh, so this is, I believe this is open. It is open. Thank you. <laughs> I had a moment of pure terror being like, do I have to search for this one as well? I'm pretty sure the rest of them are open. Pretty sure. Uh, <clears throat> So this is from Applied Linguistics. Uh, applied Linguistics generally historically has meant language learning and language instruction, uh, as opposed to theoretical linguistics, which is more modeling the knowledge of language, I guess, broadly speaking. Um, and this is by Joshua Martin and Kelly Elizabeth Wright. Uh, Kelly from uh, Virginia Tech over in Blacksburg. I'm, it's in the same state as I am, basically, is why I made that face. And then uh, Joshua Martin from uh, the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, and the it's from Applied Linguistics 2022, uh, and the title is Bias and Automatic Speech Recognition, the Case of African American Language. Uh, so this is another thing that I've studied in graduate school, and basically what I found, and to my knowledge, what every study has found since, is that ASR systems tend to work better for general American speakers, so white, upper class, highly educated folks who do not have strong regional accents and certainly don't have a specific ethnolect. So African American language, African American English, I would call an ethnolect. It's a language variety particularly associated with an ethnic group. Um, so other varieties similarly might be Chicano English, which is uh, particularly associated with um, specifically I think North American Spanish speakers, 
because I don't think that it's particularly associated with like you know people from Paraguay or whatever. Can they speak Spanish in Paraguay? They do speak Spanish in Paraguay, but I don't think it's the main language. I think there's like a another second language. Anyway, point being, um, sp- specifically um, associated with Mexican Americans more than. It's not like everyone from South America who speaks Spanish speaks Chicano English. It's a specific language variety of English associated with that particular uh, group. Uh, S9 says, hey, Rachel, I'm a new student of the science. Thank you for everything you do. Greetings. Oh, oh greetings back to you and, uh, and welcome. All right. So what are they going to find? Probably the same thing. Uh, research on bias and artificial intelligence has grown exponentially in recent years, especially around racial bias, um, which I would agree. Uh, particularly thinking here of Joy Bulamwini's work on uh, racial bias in um, computer vision. Um, many modern technologies which impact people's lives have been shown to have significant racial biases, including automatic speech recognition systems. Emergent studies have found that widely used ASR symptoms function much more poorly on the speech of black people. Yes. Uh, yet this work is limited because it lacks a deeper consideration of the sociolinguistic literature on African American language. In this paper, we seek to integrate African American language research into these endeavors to analyze ways in which ASR might be biased against the linguistic features of AAL and how the use of biased ASRs could provide could prove harmful to speakers of AAL. Um, so both like, what are the features that are being missed? And also what is the um, negative impact on speakers of this variety? Specifically, we provide an overview of the ways in which AAL has been discriminated against in the workforce and healthcare in the past. And two, explore how introducing biased ASRs into these areas could perpetuate or even deepen linguistic discrimination. Um, linguistic discrimination is discrimination against um, someone for a particular linguistic form they use generally, or language they speak, um, and generally it's a way to discriminate against a specific group of people um, that happen to use that form, right? So in this case, it would be a, a form of discrimination, racial discrimination. All right. Uh, yep, 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 a lot of discussion about it. So uh, Sophia Noble's um, Mm, algorithms uh, automating inequality, algorithms of injustice. I forget what the book title was, but basically it was looking at uh, search engines and how they they hurt people. Um, yep, and various uh, different uh, areas. And here's a uh, Joy um, and and Tim Nitt's work that I was mentioning with the the facial recognition. Um. What is this citation? <laughs> oh, oh, it's a direct quote. Uh, ASR is, quote, the process and related technology converting a speech signal into its corresponding sequence of words or other linguistic entities by means of algorithms implemented in a device, a computer, or computer clusters. Um, I thought it was weird that they cited a 2016 paper for the existence of ASR, but they are quoting the 2016 paper, which makes a lot more sense. Uh, uh, Tom says, Virginia represent. Absolutely. Alexi says, the first bunch of people who spoke to me in English were Germans. It was easier to understand Germans uh, than natives for a while to me. Yeah, because you had most more experience to them and yep, experience, experience w- with that language variety and exposure to it. So it makes perfect sense. Uh... Uh, Tom says, I really want a lot of systemic before discrimination in this paper. Uh... Yes, but also linguistic discrimination can be direct and not just systemic, right? Um, Because if you're, yes, A, I agree, but also B, um, particularly in the area of linguistic discrimination, let me just say, uh, it's not illegal, right, (laughs) to to discriminate against somebody for a linguistic reason in the United States. Um, But as we've talked about on the channel, um, your language use is inexorably tied to who you are as a person and how you show up in the world. So discrimination against a specific linguistic feature or factor may also be discrimination against a group of people, but it serves as like a proxy for it. So... Yeah, but I, I I take your point, Tom. Uh, da, 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 uh, talking about it, Sue Blodgett's paper with, I think uh, Jacob is also an author on this paper. Uh, oh, it's just the et al. Who were all the authors? Was it also, no, it was uh, Hal and Hannah. I wonder where Hannah's at right now, actually.
Mm -mm. Oh, she's at Microsoft. Okay. Was she at Microsoft then? I don't remember. I don't think so. Uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, uh, Sue Blodgett, uh, uh, same first author here as well. Uh, and then Brandon O'Connor. And I... Lee Green, maybe? I don't know that I've, I've ever met them, but uh, Brandon and Sue, I definitely have. Where are Sue is? Anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted. It's a little bit like looking at a, uh, you know, an old yearbook being like, oh yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, oh, 2022 study, I don't think I've read this. Uh, Martin 22 found that widely tapped social corpora, speech corpora used to develop and evaluate speech recognition systems to play a woeful lack of representation of African-American language. Yep. Uh, other important work such as Tapman and Kasten. Uh, and Dorn, that's Cynthia Dorn's work, uh, have come to similar conclusions about ASR and the speech of African Americans. Yes. And there's, this is the uh, PNAS paper, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was out of, out of Stanford and built on my work. Uh, yes. Uh, such bias in ASR performance has begun to display negative effects on African American speakers. Uh, Mangisha et al. 2021 investigated the behavioral and psychological consequences of African ASR errors for African American participants and found that ASR failures hindered participants in accomplishing goals and caused them to experience emotions consistent with those experienced during discrimination in human interaction. Oh, interesting. I haven't read this study. Uh, let's see. That's it. Uh, I don't think these devices are very culturally sensitive. Impacts of automated speech recognition errors on African Americans, frontiers in artificial intelligence. Interesting. I'm, mm, the title seems vaguely familiar, but I don't think I've actually read it. Uh, are we too far up? Nope. Further up. Further up. Holiday. Ooh, are they gonna talk about prosody? Yeah, heck yeah, excellent. This is Nicole Holiday. She works on uh, on prosody. We've talked about her on the channel before. Um, Prosody is so hard to study, <laughs> and she is, I would say, the foremost expert on on uh, prosody in African American English, African American language. So, sorry, I'm getting very off topic on this one. Uh, this is this is a very well cited paper. Uh, it's really pulling together a lot of the work uh, very very well. Um, ten out of ten. Really, really, really good literature review. If you're interested in getting into the space, I would highly recommend it. Actually, let me just pop this in the chat uh, for those of you who are, are interested. Oh, reach character limit. It's too long. We're on page two. I'll pop it in the chat here. And it is open access, so it should just be free to, to download and read. Uh, so, uh, hey, uh, Joshua Martin and Kelly Elizabeth Wright, 10 out of 10. Really, really excellent work. It's so nice to read a good literature review. And so rare <laughs> in NLP. I'm not being rude. It is just true. The citation practices in NLP as a field are um, lacking. Interesting. It's a really interesting study there, uh, uh, the Mengish et al. While progress is being made, these studies have been limited from deeper explorations of their intersection with the vast sociolinguistic research on African American language published over the past half century. Yes, I. Uh, so the this is an interspeech paper, and they have a pretty strict word limit. Um, so I didn't really get a chance to talk about all the features I wanted to talk about. Uh, also, I wasn't just looking at African American English. I was also looking at uh, various other dialects as well. So I think all the linguistic stuff in there is vowel inventory based, just sort of showing the differences between the different dialects systems and their vowel inventories. Ba, 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 ba. Uh, in seeking to mitigate racial biases in ASR systems, we must investigate one, the linguistic features, um, you know, various linguistic features uh, associated with the variety, how speakers whose linguistic repertoires contain such linguistic features have been discriminated against in human-to-human -human interactions, and three, the potential harms that speakers of African-American language could face, excuse me, if biased ASRs are implemented in important social arenas. Uh, one that I'm particularly concerned about is school testing, um, which ASRs have been used in. All right, uh, so let's 
see just like a super quick um, high level view of some of the features they talk about. Uh, so uh, invariant B, uh, as in formations like Bruce B running, it just means that um, I generally heard this referred to as the habitual B inside of the invariant B. Um, it's something that happens all the time. Uh, Let's see other features. I'm just starting to pick out. Usually feature names in sociolinguistic papers have some sort of formatting, and it looks like here they're using um, italics. Uh, and then sort of the, the way that those features have been reacted to uh, socially. Um, metathesis. So metathesis is um, the general process of two phonemes, two language sounds, switching positions. Um, uh, for example, uh, ask to ax, uh, so the K and the S switch, uh, very sort of certainly stereotyped and discussed feature of, uh, of African American language. Uh, the prosody, um, oh, we just saw one of dance papers in the other, uh, other paper we just talked to as well, we just read as well. It's a small field. <laughs> uh, Manipulated an audio recording of President Obama to create multiple stimuli that varied in the levels of low, high pitch accent, which occur more frequently in African American language. Um, I am not particularly good at, uh, as I mentioned before, tonal stuff. So um, just know that it is you start low and you go high. Uh, other things. Da, da, da. Oh yeah, so the this study was um, looking at discrimination in housing and whether or not someone could determine someone's race by their voice during a phone call. Um, and even just the word hello as the, the introduction to the phone call, people were able to, I think with something like 80% plus accuracy, uh, identify the, the race of the person who was calling them. Um, do, do, do. Discussions of discrimination and bias. Uh, oh yeah, the allocational harms and representational harms is by uh, Cynthia Crawford, Kate Crawford? Kate Crawford, this would be Kate. Um, allocational harms is what you get uh, when a system allocates or withholds certain groups an opportunity or resource. So that would be things like housing or um, jobs, etc. cetera. Uh, and then representational harms are being stereotyped, right? So things like blackface or um, we, we've talked about, about how voice assistants are almost always um, women, right? So the representation there is that, you know, um, creating the servant-like attitude uh, and representing that using, um, one gender. Uh, and then automation bias. Uh, so this, we've also talked about this as well. Um, so this is when you are more likely to take the output of an automated system, uh, even knowing that, you know, the system is fallible and blah, 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 et cetera. Um, yep. Uh, and then this uh, Cummings 2004 citation for that, which we've talked about on the channel quite a bit. I don't know if I've given you a citation before, uh, but this would be a good place to look for it. Uh, and then talking about all of these things, and I'm assuming they're going to look at specific features of specific systems. Oh yeah, this one is, uh, do they have the other one on um, language identification? Uh, so there was a, I, it might've been a paper by Dirk, Dirk Covey. Um, I'm trying to remember who was the first author on it. I want to say it was at ACL 2016. Uh, but basically they were looking at language identification. Um, it would have been before Coral was released. I'm pretty sure. Coral is a, a corpus of regional African-American language. Um, but they were looking at uh, language identification errors and they found that uh, African-American language was misidentified as Dutch with much higher than, than usual um, and much higher rates than chance. Uh, yeah, and then talking about different types of ASRs. Uh, 
Okay, so here's one that looks at the specific invariant slash habitual. I, like I said, I've, I've heard it called habitual be a little bit more often, but I'm not uh, primarily a scholar of, of African American language, African American English. So perhaps this is the more common term, uh, but it looks like a lot of systems were worse at uh, correctly processing sentences that contained uh, invariant B than sentences with any other form of non invariant uninflected B, with a habitual aspect of invariant B being a statistically significant factor in predicting poor performance. So it just, uh, these automated systems are not handling this particular grammatical construction, which is unique to African American language well. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, it also is true for other morphosyntactic features. Uh, um, Sulin and, and everyone else found that it was also true for dependency parsing, right? So the syntactic structure, modeling the syntactic structure of phrases. Um, Yes, and then this paper, Konecki from 2020, I think this is the, the proceedings, uh, the PNAS paper, uh, took over 200 snippets containing the same words, five ASR systems. Yeah, the results showed that even when audio containing the same word sequences, the error rate for African-American speech is twice as large as that of white American speech. Um, and in my study, the, the samples were parallel. So they were uh, recorded by professional readers, like voice actors, professionals. Um, and it was the same text that was being used each time. Uh, and then talking about uh, disparate impact and how this is more harmful for people who are using this language variety than for people who aren't using this language variety. Oh, AI-driven assessments and pre-hiring screenings and promotion. I hate this. I hate this application. It is so trivially uh, possible for discrimination to occur here. Um, for example, video-based assessments of candidates through technologies such as HireVue, Knockerai, Talview, Talview, Modern Hire, and interviewing robots like Tengai, Tengie, Tengai, are increasingly being incorporated into companies' practices. <sighs> I hate it. Um, also, in addition to being, you know, potentially discriminatory against uh, different dialect speakers, also potentially very discriminatory against people with, um, you know, who are neurodivergent or have different disabilities, because um, a lot of these are looking at like, how well can you maintain eye contact? Uh, a thing that uh, not everyone is equally good at doing, and neurodivergence is a factor in that. So, uh, these technologies examine, quote, up to 500,000 aspects of speech to judge the employability of a candidate and offer an assessment score before any human is involved in the process. Given, you know, the all of this cited research about how it's such an issue that these systems don't handle, in particular, African-American language as well as, you know, general American English, the prestige uh, variety, bad, <laughs> not good, uh, yep. Oh. Anyway, and they're just talking about all the people that are using higher view uh, and the the issues, like the fact that this is so automated and the fact that the systems that are automated on have bias as part of them means that this is almost certainly negatively impacting some folks more than others. Uh, Griff Ferris, legal and policy offer, officer for Big Brother Watch, which I believe is an anti-surveillance activism organization, highlights this exact concern. As with many of these systems, unless the algorithm has been trained on an extremely diverse data set, there's a very high likelihood that it may be biased in some way. And even if the data set is biased, if there, even if the data set is diverse, if there is bias in that data set, right? So more examples of the non-hireable uh, group examples come from a specific group, then the higher bowl examples, you're likely to get some sort of data leakage there. Uh, there's a very high likelihood that it may be biased in some way, resulting in candidates from certain backgrounds being unfairly excluded and discriminated against. All of this could result in the allocational harm of African Americans systematically being denied jobs simply because of their speech. So, not great. And I mean, you may think, well, clearly our option there is that we just need more data. Um, but I would say that that using that line of thought can then be used to justify surveillance for data collection, something that um, is almost certainly going to be militarized <laughs> and folded into the police system here in the United States. We've talked about this 
at length before on the channel. Um, so my, my recommendation to avoid these harms would be just not to automate it, right? Like, just do, don't automate it. Don't use the system. Um, so, yep. Uh, and then talking about reinforcing uh, by like, if you're already saying like, hey, this group of people is great, uh, we're gonna use their speech as examples of people who are great if they all tend to speak alike and that speech represents um, the type of usage related to a specific social group or excludes a particular social group, that's gonna be an issue too. Uh, yep, other areas. <clears throat> Other areas as well, uh, in healthcare, I don't want to read the whole thing, uh, but um, definitely worrying, right? So um, there's this bias, it's been shown again and again, pretty much everyone who looks for it in ASR systems tends to find it. Um, and I would say this is specifically talking about African American language, but it also relates to regional varieties. So I mentioned, you know, Southern American English that is not African American uh, English, but has some, some relations due to, due to contact. Um, also tends to perform worse in these systems, right? Any strong regional variety tends to perform worse in these systems, like Scottish English tends to perform worse in these systems. Um, and that's uh, going to hurt people from those groups who don't have, you know, or haven't developed. Let me see if I can do my... <clears throat> who haven't developed a very... Um, sort of neutrally judged, professional, very educated sounding uh, dialect. So, and then going back to my home dialect. <laughs> uh, like I mentioned, I am bi-dialectal and it's something I didn't realize until I was, um, I noticed my mom doing it, right? Like I noticed my mom talk differently to like bankers than she did to other farmers. And I was like, ah, oh, that's weird. Um, and I didn't realize that I did it until I was quite a bit older, um, but yeah. Anyway, uh, really good paper, super, super well, uh, well cited, really good jumping off point if you're interested in reading more about this work, uh, include some, some studies I wasn't familiar with, particularly more recent ones. So um, yeah, great work. I think a great discussion and um, really important to think about, particularly if you're thinking about applying these systems in a, in a professional setting, you know, language technologists, we know that these systems are biased. We know that they're biased against specific people or specific groups of people that have been historically um, and currently <laughs> uh, discriminated against. And of course, this is all in the US setting, all in the US context, but I'm sure those of you who are not from the US can think of, you know, particular groups associated with particular language varieties in your own, you know, local context uh, where a similar process is, is very likely to occur. So be good to keep in mind. Uh, great work, Martin and Wright, 10 out of 10, very good paper. Uh, if I was teaching right now, I'd probably assign it to students. I have finished all my teaching for the year though, so. All right, more stuff on dialect. Uh, so this is a preprint, uh, right? We are out of the realm of published research that's so been peer reviewed. Uh, and it looks like it's out of Google Research, USC, University of Southern California, and UMass Amherst, uh, which are all pretty well known for, for doing, well, maybe not USC as much, uh, but certainly Google and UMass are, are known for their, their language research in particular. I wanna say there's a lot of folks at UMass doing like, oh wait, did they get rid of their master's program a while ago? One sec. There was something I remember hearing about linguistics a while ago uh, where they like, it might not have been UMass, it might have been something else in near. Uh, they have an applied linguistics PhD, but I don't think that would be in the linguistics department. I think that would be in the applied linguistics department. Um, Anyway, they're quite quite well known as a, a good linguistic school. What? Uh, graduate program. They have a PhD. Okay, I think they just have a PhD. I think they used to have a master's and they don't anymore. And I vaguely remember hearing about that, uh, but I, I don't have a source to that for hand, so I could be wrong about it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, one of the authors is from there um, and also has uh, an affiliation from Google. So it looks like everyone here is at Google. Um, 
Jacob used to be at Georgia, I'm pretty sure, and then moved out to Seattle and, and uh, joined Google. Well, I was there, actually. Uh, so, uh, abstract. Evaluation metrics that are not robust robust, robust to dialectal variation, uh, make it impossible to tell how well systems perform for many groups of users, and can even penalize systems for producing text in lower resource dialects. However, currently, there exists no way to quantify how metrics respond to change in the dialects of generated utterances. We thus formalize dialect robustness and dialect awareness as goals for NLG evaluation metrics. Um, right, so if we're, if we're thinking about, you know, language generation, which, I don't know. I can't not, right? Uh, Alexi says, I didn't really notice my dialect uh, until recently. It's not really about pronunciation, but manner of speech. Now I notice it everywhere. Ah, you're developing that metalinguistic awareness. <laughs> uh, yeah, hanging out with linguists will do that to you. You'll start noticing things. Um, yeah, and I, you know, from, from what you said, I think that it might potentially be a dialect that uh, is associated with... Um, I don't know. Certain stereotypes, right? Uh, yeah, so basically I was saying, hey, these text generation systems, they may be penalized for producing text that sounds like it's from a specific dialect. Uh, we introduce a suite of methods. Suite of methods? Suite of methods. Suite of methods. Yeah. Uh, and corresponding statistical tests one can use to assess, a, assess metrics in light of two goals. I am interested what dialects they're going to use here. Uh, oh, they're, they're taking a stance on dialects of Mandarin. That's always a little fraught. Mm, that, that is always a little fraught. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. Uh, applying the suite to current state-of-the-art metrics, we demonstrate that they are not dialect robust, that does not surprise me, uh, and that semantic perturbations frequently lead to smaller decreases in metrics than an increased introduction of dialect features. Uh, a first step to overcome this limitation, we propose a training screen, schema, Nano, which introduces regional and language information to the pre-training process of a metric. We demonstrate that Nano provides a size-efficient way for models to improve the dialect robustness while simultaneously improving their performance on a standard metric benchmark. Um, so basically what they're promising here is A, you're going to be able to know if your system can handle different dialects. Um, they also show that uh, for current metrics, uh, if you don't handle dialects well or a different dialects well, it's going to look like you're if you do handle different dialects well, it's going to look like your system is doing worse, even though it should be kind of neutral, right? Because um, generally you're looking for specific semantic output. Um, yeah. Uh, Alexi says, I don't think it's associated by, with any stereotypes in my case, but it just sounds funny if you think of it. Uh, not all dialects are. All right, uh, and this is long. <laughs> okay, it's mostly citations though, and uh, end bits. So it looks like it's about 10 pages. Um, I think, hmm. I think what's gonna be most interesting to me is what specific, uh, data they are using and sorry, I just noticed they were using mixed effect regression. Um, what features they are using and how they are adding these perturbations. Uh, I think that's going to be what's most interesting to me. So we're probably gonna, only going to read the first couple pages uh, and then not go super deep into all of the metrics and math and stuff just because I don't care that much. <laughs> uh, I, I would, I'm being very frank, like natural language generation metrics is not something, it's something I want to know about and that I want to know what's happening, but it's not something that I care deeply about the internals of because I'm not doing NLG and I don't intend to in the near future, certainly as a primary professional activity. Uh, 
interesting. Uh, most natural language generation evaluation metrics compare a system output against a human written reference. References are usually drawn from a relatively narrow range of linguistic styles. True, styles, not dialect. <laughs> they are different. Uh, they often exclude varieties like Indian English or Iberian Portuguese, which are geographical dialects with millions of speakers. As a result, outputs in dialects that are not represented in the reference may score poorly, discouraging the development of systems to meet the needs of those language communities. What a perverse incentive, right? So they're saying like, hey, if you build a system that works particularly well for a particular group of users uh, with millions of speakers, uh, because number goes down on the leaderboard, people may not work on it. Sometimes this field just makes me sad and tired. Like I know they're right, I'm not saying they're wrong, uh, but it is the fact that they are right that just makes me want to take a nap. <laughs> Turn off my computer and take a nap. Although contemporary metrics such as Comet can be reference free, they still rely on training data and rater pools that do not cover all dialects of interest, leading to a high number of out of domain dialects. The performance of evaluation metrics on these out of domain dialects has not been quantified. So basically you have a reference uh, and they are having a hard time covering all potential dialects of interest, which to be fair, I don't know that covering all dialects of interest is a good, I don't know, y'all know me, I like purpose built, I like narrow use systems. So for me, I would build a system for Iberian Portuguese would be my approach in this in this case. Although I probably wouldn't build a system for Iberian Portuguese because I'm not familiar with the language uh, and also not a part of the language community. But thinking about my language varieties, like I would build a system, you know, that focuses on Southern American English or, you know, other other relevant varieties. Uh, we define a dialect robust evaluation metric as one that produces the same score for system outputs that share the same semantics but are expressed in different dialects. So I'm assuming this is going to be lexical in nature, um, potentially also slightly grammatical, but certainly if they're focusing on text, it's not going to be phonological. Uh, Alexi says, I've heard the people in the who speak on nationwide TV in the US are trained to speak, quote, without accent. Is this true? I mean, no one doesn't have an accent. That's certainly something that people say. Um, there is a particular vocal um, styling associated with news reporting um, that is not accentless, right? It is a specific style. Um, and it's changed over time, right? So if you listen to older American reporting from let's say the 40s and 50s, you'll have this mid-Atlantic, um, it's what, what it was called, style, which is very, very distinctive, right? Um, like stock prices fell 14%, I can't really do it. Um, and then the, the sort of the modern new style is, um, maybe I can do it, let's see. <laughs> That's one of those things I'm not, I haven't really worked on trying to do, so I can't necessarily mimic it very well, but to understand whether current evaluation metrics are dialect robust, we propose to quantify the dialect robustness at the dialect feature level and sentence level, would be sort of like current US news speak. And it's not not accented, right? It has generally in the US people retain a lot of the phonological features of their underlying dialect, their native dialect, and what they will change and what they tend to notice is lexical features and grammatical features. Um, or syntactic features, morphological constructions, etc. In the US, people don't tend to pay as much attention to fine level language sounds as they do in, say, England, uh, where particular language sounds are often, you know, picked up on and, and mimicked. Language, uh, language attitudes and, uh, you know, sociolinguistic attitude research is the, the field that looks at that. Ba, 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 ba. All right, so looking at features and sentence level. Uh, the analysis measures the dialect sensitivity of evaluation metrics by comparing semantics per serving dialect edits to perturbations that change the meaning of sentences. What are your dialect edits? Throughout our analysis, we demonstrate that multiple state-of-the-art NLG evaluation metrics are not robust to dialects of Mandarin. Again, that's choice, English and Portuguese. Um, I don't know what dialects they are specifically looking at. Sometimes when people say dialects of, American, of Mandarin, they mean what I would personally call different languages based on the amount of uh, grammatical, lexical, and phonological distinction between the two. Sometimes they mean, you know, different, um, 
things that I would maybe call dialects. I don't know. I'm sure they'll, they'll have more, uh, more discussion later on. Alexi says, some people there sound like they come from nowhere. Very creepy. There is actually, again, in, uh, in perceptual dialectology, so people's understanding of, of the dialects of the United States, there is a place called the Nowhere Trough, um, where people don't have strong intuitions about what people like from there sound like. Um, it's usually sort of uh, Missouri-y. Let's see. Is there going to be a good image for this on, just like on Google? Also, how do you spell trough? Uh, ping trough. T R O U G H. Can I find a map of the nowhere trough? This is very technical. <laughs> uh, linguist weirdness. Uh, maybe I can find it on Scholar? Hmm. Hmm. Perceptual dialectology. I'm looking for a map, basically. Uh, 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 maybe this paper from 2011. Dennis Preston. Uh, none of these are open accents. Um or none of these are open access. Uh, anyway, perceptual dialectology is the field, and uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, the general, uh, no, I just, just want the map. <laughs> there we go. Doop. Oh, right, I can't move it from there. Uh, da, da, da. Sorry, I'm just trying to, to show you what I mean. Uh, so we have the US map and the nowhere trough is sort of, can you see my mouse? I don't know that you can't, you can't. Uh, so there's Texas down there at the bottom in the middle uh, and right above it that looks sort of like a pan with a handle, that's Oklahoma. Uh, and to the west of that and sort of north along there, kind of along the Rockies uh, is where people tend not to have strong ideas about how people speak. Um, it's a really interesting field, perceptual dialectology. Anyway, moving on. Uh, it's an unsupervised pre-training step to a metric that distills dialect information of the multilingual pre-training data set into a model, which we demonstrate leads to improved dialect robustness. Okay, interesting. Um, I do like that this paper is thinking about dialect as an important feature, um, both for, for production and evaluation. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, I can show the people DOI. Uh, so the, it's a, a book that I was looking at, um, do, 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 do. uh, another one of these, you know, 150 page PDFs, uh, perceptual dialectology, non-linguist view of aerial linguistics, A-R-E-A-L as in relating to area, not from the sky, uh, by Dennis Preston, uh, was the book. I'll pop the link to that in the chat as well. If someone wants to, you know. Uh, find it in the library or something similar. Uh, -do. Uh, dialects can be regarded as linguistic subdivisions uh, that align with communities of speakers, often grouped by geographic or demographic attributes. Uh, good citation for that, the chambers. A uh, classic example is nation level varieties, such as Brazilian I and Iberian Portuguese, Iberian being the Iberian Peninsula where Brazil and Spain are. Uh, and then in his an example of dialect robustness in the context of, uh, of generation evaluation. We define dialect robustness as evaluation metrics that are expected to have the same output across dialects that share the same semantics. Dialect edits highlighted in yellow should not lead to greater degradation of score than edits that change the underlying semantics. Highlight underline. Okay. So here we have this uh, English US. As recently as April, there was a big fight. English, uh, Indian, I'm assuming. Recently, only in April, there was a big fight. So this should be a dis difference between dialect, but it didn't change the meaning. Whereas as recently as May, there was a big fight that does change the meaning. So this should be a, from the perturbation to the US English should be a bigger change than from the US English to the Indian English. And that's Portuguese. Um, 
Mm, at what hour does the restaurant open for uh, the Iberian Portuguese as like coffee of something? Uh, and then the Brazilian says, Pequen. This might mean breakfast. This might mean breakfast. <laughs> don't, don't take it from me. I don't speak Portuguese. I just know a little French, which is sort of related. And that's how I'm getting there. Um, so I'm guessing that this is the Brazilian word for breakfast. Is, uh, Brazilian Portuguese is, of course, the Portuguese word for breakfast, which I could be wrong about. And I'm guessing that if pequeno, if this top one means breakfast, then this middle one probably means lunch. I'm guessing this is like little lunch. Uh, this is like, well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so the, basically they're saying if you change the meaning, it should be more than if you, the difference should be greater than if you change the, the dialect word. So it looks like the features that they're using here are primarily lexical. Uh, they're using different dialect features. Uh, one working definition of dialect is a set of correlated features. That, that, that is a working definition, yep. Uh, da, da, da. The left side shows the English dialect feature focus only, which distinguishes Indian English from other varieties such as U.S. English. Uh, Alexi says, Northwest from Oklahoma is Colorado, right? As you're making me look at this, uh, Oklahoma. All right, these are the four corners. So it is Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, that's Wyoming. Process of elimination, I'm pretty sure that's Colorado. Yes, because <laughs> uh, that's Montana. I don't, you can't see my mouse cursor, but I think that is Colorado. Uh, don't test me on US geography. <laughs> they all, uh, they, they, you know. I'll try my best. All right, uh, the right panel figure one shows the Portuguese dialect feature for different lexical choice with the same semantics uh, for breakfast. I was right. <laughs> uh, which distinguishes Iberian Portuguese from Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, many dialect f features are acceptable in multiple dialects. For example, uh, zero definite article is used in uh, Indian English, Singapore English, and several other post-colonial dialects. Um, so definite articles, um, this, no, the, I think there might be some others in English, but it's mainly the. So instead of saying the main reason is, you would say main reason is. Um, so removing that that feature. Uh, so yeah, it looks like it's also going to be some syntactic morphological features, right? Like what's an acceptable uh, construction in a specific variety, uh, but also specifically lexical choice. So words. Uh, consider a translation system that produces Iberian Portuguese outputs at a task where it is desirable to generate text in a variety of dialects. If all the training data for the metrics used to evaluate generation quality comes from Brazilian Portuguese, which has many more speakers, uh, it will likely assign a lower score to Iberian Portuguese outputs, thereby misrepresenting system quality and disincentivizing further development of the more diverse system in favor of one that only produces Brazilian Portuguese. And I'm gonna double check uh, the number of speakers. Uh, da, da, da. Yes, how many people speak it? Uh, so 214 million uh, Brazilian Portuguese speakers as opposed to... Uh, 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 I'm looking for um, Iberian Portuguese as the opposite. I'm on Wikipedia. That's what I have open in another uh, another tab here. Miriam uh, Portuguese. Mm -mm. Yes. Yes, but how many people speak it? Uh, not helpful. Brief history of Portuguese. Yes, how many people speak it? Uh, <clears throat> 
232 million native, and it was what, 214 million? Okay, so 211 million, so about, at max, 20 million people speak Iberian Portuguese. It was about an order of magnitude fewer. Uh, well, it's because we're talking about Missouri, that got me confused. They touch, don't they? No, they absolutely do not. They are nowhere near each other. Uh, but like the, the Dakotas, right? I don't, well, no, people have, have you know, Fargo has some um, stereotypical speech in it. Anyway, I was looking for a citation for where specifically it is, because um, I know too much to, <laughs> to be able to tell you where people don't know things. <clears throat> anyway, uh, all right, so there, the definition of dialect robustness is that it can handle uh, the differences in dialect and uh, doesn't care about them and does care about the differences between uh, semantics. Uh, dialect awareness, uh, da, 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 da. in this case, a dialect robust metric is undesirable because you're trying to go from variety A to variety B because it's unable to detect this mistake. To account for these cases, we define dialect awareness. Uh, okay, so it knows that they're different, basically. Uh, informally, <coughs> excuse me, a metric is dialect where if given a dialect identifier and pair of semantically equivalent texts that vary by dialect, it assigns the highest score to the text with the dialect specified by the identifier. Okay, so this is sort of like a multi-label problem. Um, well, it's not labeling, right? But it's like a identifying that one is closer than the other. So I guess it's a, mm, sort of like speaker adaptation. It's picking points vectors, areas in the, the representation space and, and determining uh, which one it's closer to. Uh, dialect awareness is undefined with respect to inputs that are not semantically equivalent. Okay, I got it. So they have to mean the same thing. This means the definition is agnostic to whether the metric should prioritize matching the target semantics or the target dialect, because if the semantics mismatch, it will always choose to match the semantics. Um, only when the semantics match will the target dialect uh, comparison kick in. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, another section, is semantic equivalence realistic? The above definitions presume it is possible to characterize utterances and dialect different, different dialects as semantically equivalent. Such characterizations have been uh, criticized for lacking a strong foundation for semantic equivalence outside the, lim the limited case where the f dialect differences are purely phonological, right? So uh, let's say that the, um, you know, these two different words for breakfast actually represent sort of different meals, right? Maybe they're eaten at different times or the general foods that are there are different and the things that's equivalent about it is that it's generally the first meal of the day, but otherwise the expectation if you use those different words is gonna be very different, right? Um, so in that case, you can't really say they're semantically equivalent because they do mean different things. Uh, Alexi says, so from which US state do people from nowhere come from? Yeah, it's not. Again, everyone has an accent. One of the stereotypes historically was that people from Ohio didn't speak with an accent. Uh, that's what people from Ohio would tell you. Uh, but I certainly, uh, <coughs> Ohio has a distinct dialect from the dialect that I speak. Uh, and people from Ohio sound different <laughs> uh, than sort of my default expectation. So. Uh, to avoid the gray area between dialect differences that change semantics and those that do not, we design perturbations that have a small surface level impact on the original utterance, but a strong effect on its meaning, e.g. by negating the main proposition or changing an important semantic argument. Uh, this establishes a necessary but not sufficient condition for dialect robustness. If a metric scores such perturbations more highly than dialect pairs, it is almost certainly not dialect robust. Proving that a metric is dialect robust is more difficult because it requires constructing more subtle semantic perturbations that are harder to distinguish even conceptually from dialect variables. So basically they're saying, hey, if your system can't handle a big change, we know that it probably also can't handle small changes. If it can handle a big change, that doesn't necessarily mean that it can handle small changes, but it's evidence that it's better than a system that can't handle this big change is sort of the argumentation there, which makes sense. Uh, and then they use uh, different uh, other metrics like blue, Turf, C H R F, uh, which I'm not familiar with. It's from uh, Popovic 2015 paper. Uh, various distributed evaluation metrics like Bluert and Comet. 
Uh, Bluert pre-trains Rembert on augmented data from Wikipedia. I think that's for English, not English. Uh, I thought this wasn't an English model, but I could be wrong about that. Um, on human data ratings from WMT Corpus. Okay, yeah. again, I really don't care about this at this point. <laughs> um, I would if I were working in it, but I'm not right now, so that's okay. I can always go back and read it if I am more interested. Uh, okay, and micro-level dialect features. Uh, so talking about things like spelling, O-R versus O-U-R for things like flavor, um, which in the U.S. would be O-R and in the U.K. would be O-U-R. Uh, uh, this sort of like uh, only focus, focus only, so only being inserted to focus a specific uh, phrase. Uh, oh, yeah, I was wondering if you could hear that or not, uh, the sirens in the distance. Uh, Yep, and now they're just, uh, you know, formally defining the these measures. Uh, we consider three perturbation types, deletion, replacement, and insertion. So these are the semantic perturbations. So um, if a sentence is semantically perturbated from its first sentence, it should be ranked worse. Uh, if it is dialectally perturbated, it should hopefully not be ranked worst. Uh, there are no standard techniques for applying semantic perturbation, so we applied few shot learning by prompting lambda. Yeah, of course they did. Um, also, there's maybe lambda might be being released publicly soon-ish. Someone said something on Twitter that sounded like that might be happening, so who knows. Uh, for each perturbation type, we provide five exemplars and then prompt blah, 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 blah. Uh, some sentences are not amenable to all perturbations. For example, some are too short to support deletion, so we choose one perturbation per sentence with the preference order of replacement, insertion, and then deletion, determined by success rate of having different sentence output. So now they're basically just talking about all the different things that they're doing. Uh, the sentence level rewrites. Uh, are they doing, how are they doing these rewrites? Uh, they're doing machine translation. Hmm. How are they doing the rewrites? Uh, ah, Lambda. Okay, again. Uh, Lambda is, um, um, Google's conversational, um, they're like their version of ChatGPT, basically. Um, uh, Alexi says, uh, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Like I, I've said before, I've said again, it just doesn't, I don't really have a need for it right now, you know? Um, although I think that, you know, creating, um, creating these perturbations using Lambda or using some other language model instead of doing it by hand, uh, as long as you're checking them carefully, I think that's perfectly reasonable, uh, and a good labor saving choice, right? Um, of course, I probably wouldn't use it to test the same model that, uh, you know, uh, generated it in the first place, but I'm, I'm not upset about this if they are, you know, I'm, I think the semantic perturbations, pretty straightforward. I think that could work pretty well. The dialect perturbations, I'd want someone who's very familiar with that dialect to be one of the reviewers uh, to make sure that the, the quality of the generations match what is needed. Uh, anyway, and uh, then they're sort of using their um, their measures. They used T5. That makes sense because I'm pretty sure this is another Google. MT5 is is Google, right? Pretty sure. Mm -mm -mm. Yes, yes, but who is it by? Uh, archive, yes. Sorry, I'm clicking through all of the various links to get to who is the affiliation. Uh, yeah, Google. Uh, so it makes sense because it's their model. I'm sure they just have it lying around. Uh, yeah, and then various uh, things here. Machine translation versus semantic perturbation. So... Dialect versus semantic perturbation. Coefficients. 
the higher dialect versus perturbation is, the more dialect robust the model is. Okay, so you want the blue to be high. Uh, and the orange dot here, the blue X you want to be high, and the orange dot we use as a stress test to measure evaluation metrics ability of recognizing semantic changes. We saw that evaluation metrics are good at recognizing semantic changes, but not dialect changes. Okay, so the point here is basically that the orange dots here are very high, the uh, blue X's are very low, and you want the blue X's to ideally be near the orange dots, and in all of these cases it looks like they're not, and these bars are just error bars. For all uh, metrics except blue and nano, uh, nano is the one that they are providing, right? So the, basically their point is like, hey, look in this first piece here, uh, the X's and the dots are very close to each other, which means that this is much better at being like, hey, the dialect change was fine, semantic change, less good. Uh, the phi dialect minus phi, I think that's a phi, perturb is negative for at least one language, exposing their vulnerability to dialects. Vulnerability to dialects, you know. Uh, that just uh, strikes me as funny. Uh, Alexi says, the thing I like about GPT and stuff, uh, it's not the fact that they're generative, but the fact that they are, quote, general. Uh, for good or bad, it's got to be defined by us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... I think it's helpful. They, I think they can be helpful as tools in a larger pipeline, but I would want the larger pipeline to be purpose specific purpose built, right? Like, again, I like narrow use cases because they are easy to define and easy to measure, whereas very general use cases aren't. Um, and I think as a tool to do other things um, with additional, you know, safeguards and stuff, I think it's you know perfectly reasonable. It, you know. Language modeling has been around for decades. This is not a new task. This is not a new application of it. It usually is part of a system. Uh, and I'm perfectly fine with that. And I mean, the promise that folks made when they were training these huge systems and people were like, wow, that's expensive. That's a lot of carbon emissions was always that, well, we just need to train the one and then everyone can use it. Um, and you know, um, overall there will be less emissions, et cetera, because you know, we can, we can reuse the thing. Um, but then of course every, you know, everyone's training their own one and they're all trying to train the biggest one, so they're retraining them from scratch. Um, so I don't know that that promise is really held up long-term. Um, and also the reason that they're doing that is so that they can charge you to use it, which is also something that like, I, you know, we all use APIs. I don't think it's, there's inherently anything wrong with that, but um, yeah, also vulnerability to dialects. So anyway, the point that they're making here is that uh, they don't work as well for all dialects. Um, doing changes between doing dialect output that reflects a normal usage in a specific dialect, even if uh, the semantics are the same between the target and the output, uh, results in worse performance for all measures, except for theirs. So if you care about dialect performance, you should use their nano measure, uh, is the point that they are making there. So let's uh, let's wrap up. I think that's sort of the main points, uh, and then they go into many, many, many more different types of metrics and measures, etc. Um, but I think that's the main point that they are making. And if you're interested in reading more, it's on Archive. Uh, and I don't have a deep background in uh, generation evaluation metrics, so I'm not really qualified to peer review this. Um, I think it's a good point. Uh, I think that's good to know about, and it's a good thing to measure. Um, and it's nice to see people taking dialect differences very seriously uh, in, in an NLP context, because they are serious to people out there in the world who are using our products. All right, speaking of things I'm not qualified to review, uh, I think we'll probably just read the abstract on this one. Uh, so like I said, uh, this was from Mark R, whose last name, one sec. I can find out this information. Uh, do, 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 do. Mm. 
I'm looking on Mastodon and my God, there's so many of them. <laughs> uh, a lot of notifications that I'm looking for. Uh, I am gonna try and find this though, because I would like to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and I am Mark Riedel. Um, let me get a link to this. Da, 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 da. R, uh, R I E D L. We've talked about uh, it. We've talked about some of his work before. And can I get the link? Can I get the link? Please. There we go. I will post it <laughs> in the chat as well. If you're interested in, in following Mark, he's on sigmoid.social. Um, Yes, so this is where I found out about the paper. Thank you, Mark. Uh, he works in generative stuff, I don't. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Alexi says, things seem to go in an interesting direction in this regard. Uh, very excited, but scary, yeah. Uh, so this is out of University of Maryland College Park and New York University. Uh, it is, again, I don't believe has been peer reviewed. Uh, I do appreciate that they use the little emojis. Uh, I believe, the University of Maryland's mascot is like the fighting terrapins. So I think this is related to the specific uh, mascot of the university. Um, I'm not 100% sure that that's true and I could check it, but I'm not going to. Uh, and basically, you know, the headline is in the first figure. Uh, and the thing that they are pointing out is that here on the bottom row are uh, images from uh, that were scraped from Lion A, so not Lion 400M, which we've talked about before. Um, and then at the top, there are images that have been generated, and there are here six images, um, a picture of a woman at the Golden Globes Awards, a screenshot from like, I think a video game poster of, yeah, that might be from Dishonored, possibly. Um, of someone wearing a coat and holding two guns looking off into the distance, uh, a picture looking down of a phone on a table with um, some stuff around it, a laptop, a plant, some notebooks, uh, a wolf walking towards a, um, oh, a bunch of wolves walking towards a snowy house with the Northern Lights, uh, a shoe on uh, like a concrete surface with like a weathered looking background and a couch with two blankets on it with a gray wall behind it with a picture on it. Uh, and the content of the pictures is different, the pictures on the wall, but otherwise these are uh, certainly in terms of composition and color palette, uh, very all extremely similar to each other. So, uh, Uh, <laughs> Alexi says, a turtle is better than the crosses that people tend to use. Uh, first, I thought it meant that a scientist died. Yeah, there is um, there is a canonical order that you use different uh, footnote things in, right? So, like, it's something like, oh, if somebody has a link to it or knows it off the top of the head, feel free to share. But it's like the asterisk is first, and then you have, like, at some point, it's the little, like, dagger emoji, and at some point, it's, like, various other things. But there's, like, a specific order that you use them to match footnotes. Um, yeah. Uh, the G in AGI stands for general. Seems to be one of the fundamental defining differences between human and artificial intelligences. Are you saying that humans don't have general intelligences? <laughs> I would say that humans are very good at being generalists. Um, I also think AGI is, um, and neither a feasible nor particularly interesting goal to work to towards, uh, but perhaps that is clear because I've never claimed to be doing that and kind of look uh, skeptically at people who do. I also think it's being used as a sort of pie in the sky premise to justify a lot of um, behavior that I think is neither, you know, direct, that I think is directly harmful to society and individuals. All right. Uh, Andre says it's bloodborne. That's, yes, thank you. Um, yes, I've not played it, but I, I think you have like, I think it's like sort of like a gothy Victorian kind of vibe to it. Anyway. Uh, a poster of a, an image of a poster for Bloodborne that's being reproduced, um, not identically, right? Like they are not pixel for pixel exactly the same, but if you showed me these two pictures and are like, are these, you know, very similar, I would say they sure are. Uh, 
Uh, Alexi says, I mean, to the contrary, uh, humans are general AF to a fault. Ah, being generalist is a good man. Um, that's how, that's how you survive a mass extinction. You could be a little like clever omnivore that lives in groups and isn't too big, uh, at least historically. Uh, so the title of the paper is Diffusion Art or Digital Forgery, Investigating Data Replication and Diffusion Models uh, by Gauthami Sampali, Vasu Singla, again, apologies to anyone whose name I'm saying incorrectly, uh, Micah Goldblum, Goldblum. Was this an author on one of the other papers we looked at today? No, I think I just read it earlier. Um, Yo Jonas Gaping? Jonas Gaping? Jonas. Why would I say Jonas? Jonas is like a normal common name. <laughs> I told you, reading is so hard. Uh, and Tom Goldstein, Goldstein, etc. Uh, and the uh, text underneath the caption of the image says, Stable Diffusion is capable of reproducing training data, creating images by piecing together foreground and background objects that it has memorized. Furthermore, the system sometimes exhibits reconstructed memory in which recalled objects are semantically equivalent to their source object without being pixel-wise identical. Here, we show this behavior occurring with a range of prompts. Uh, sampled from Lyon with a handcrafted prompt, rightmost pair, um, so that's the one with the, the image on the wall behind the couch. In the top, it's a red M, which I think is like a University of Maryland thing. And in the bottom, it looks like a cityscape. Uh, da, da, da. The presence of such images raises questions about the nature of data memorization and ownership of diffusion images. Top row, generated images. Bottom row, closest match in the Lyon Aesthetics V2 6 plus set. Sometimes source and match prompts were quite similar, and sometimes they are quite different. Oh, that is no good. <laughs> See figure seven for more examples with prompts or the appendix for prompts from this figure. Um, so what that means is even if you are trying very hard not to, right, like you are writing prompts that are intended to be quite distinct, you may end up more or less reproducing an image in the training data. Um, not good. Uh, abstract. Cutting-edge diffusion models produce images with high quality and customizability, enabling them to be used for commercial art and graphic design purposes. But do diffusion models create unique works of art, or are they replicating content directly from their training sets? Which I've definitely seen people claiming that the latter isn't the case, right, when talking about particularly telling artists they shouldn't be mad that their art was stolen for commercial applications. Um, and, uh, you know, given previous work on large language models that found that, um, Again, pretty much everyone who's looked for memorization has been able to find it, even for data points that only occurred once in the training data. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the underlying architecture of computer vision models, so perhaps you know I didn't have good evidence that this wasn't occurring in diffusion models, uh, but this, this feels pretty damning. Uh, applying our frameworks to diffusion models trained on multiple data sets, including Oxford Flowers, Celeb A, ImageNet, and Lion, we discuss fa how factors such as training set size impact rates of content replication. We also identify cases where diffusion models, including the popular stable diffusion model, blatantly copy from their training data. Yeah. Uh, Alexi says memorization was a huge problem for early GANs as well. Oh, interested. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, like I've said, I've never worked in computer vision by choice. <laughs> uh, a lot of the applications of computer vision are straight up surveillance technology, which is something that I personally am, you know, morally and ethically opposed to and think makes the world worse. Uh, we've talked about that at length. Speaking of cop stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and just sort of scrolling here, to machine learning theorists, memorization is synonymous with overfitting, which eh, fits with my, my understanding. Uh, in the field of membership inference attacks, one seeks to determine whether a chosen image was part of the training set. Indeed, it has been shown that models retain a memory of the contents of their training set, particularly when training samples are repeated. Uh, but again, from the large language model literature, we know for large language models, it does not have to have been repeated to be memorized which is a big problem when the thing that was not repeated but was memorized was PII, um, which is what the Google paper was looking at specifically. Note that membership inference can be done by reconstructing original training data from the model, although this is not the goal of most membership inference methods. Um, and this is something that is, of course, an issue if you are claiming that your model is not capable of copying images, if, of course, it can. 
Um, this problem of explicitly reconstructing images from the training data set of a classifier is known as model inversion. Um, also very possible to do with large language models, and uh, the way that you would avoid it is not directly serving raw generated text to users. Um, even with safeguards, right, we've seen with GPT-3, there are, or chat GPT rather, there are a large number of adversarial attacks um, and more being discovered every day, and there are no good mitigation strategies against them as a class. Perhaps in, who knows, two, three years, that will be the case, but currently it's not. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alexi says, to uh, some degree, it's also a feature of human intelligence. Sometimes we just cargo cult our way to solve some problems, especially in programming. Um, I mean, yes. And also, I think, I think fundamentally people prefer to do less work rather than more work, right? Folks are, are lazy and that's fine. That leads to efficiency. I don't think it's inherently a bad thing. Um, but when the work that they're not doing is important intellectual work, uh, that can create problems down the line, right? That's why it's labor. That's why we get paid for it, Theor theoretically. Robbie says incident happened somewhere uh, in my area. I mean, maybe, um, could be any number of things. The US is extremely over-policed, so, period. <laughs> All right, uh, memorization in language. So that's something I'm more familiar with. And then diffusion models, uh, which I'm less familiar with. Uh, diffusion is a process for converting samples from a Gaussian noise distribution into samples from an arbitrarily and more complex distribution, such as the distribution of natural images. Uh, we consider several variants, uh, such as stable diffusion, which was trained on the Lyon data set. Uh, in this version, we act, we analyze version 1.4, which was originally trained on over 2 billion images and then fine-tuned with 600 million images from the Lion Aesthetics V2 5 plus subset, which is filtered for image quality. We search for matches only in the much smaller 12 million Lion Aesthetics V2 6 plus set to keep storage costs manageable. So it's possible that the degree of memorization is even higher than they found. Uh, however, because they were looking specifically for, um, you know, they didn't have enough money to keep a bunch of images around. They used only the smaller data set. Right. Um, I have no idea what figure two is relating to. Synthetic data sets. A is the original images. B is the segmex generation. C is diagonal outpainting. And D is patch outpainting. Oh, I see. So these are just ways of doing data augmentation by, you know, copying and pasting, you know, things with outlines, uh, changing stuff around the middle of a picture, uh, etc. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Alex says, I live in a city center next to a hospital, police station, and fire station. I hear sirens all the time. No. Uh, yes. Uh, so they are specifically saying, we say that a generated image has been replicated, has replicated content if it contains an object, either in the foreground or background, that appears identically in the training image, neglecting minor variations in appearance that could result from data augmentation. Oh, got it. So they're saying because these data augmentation processes are going on, it could be memorizing an augmented piece of data instead of the original piece of data. All right. Uh, Oh, and then there's, this is the specific set of data augmentation that they are doing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and here they're looking at matches. Uh, okay, so, and basically it looks like the more data you train on, uh, the less likely you are to get complete replication, which eh, that makes sense to me, right? Uh, more data is one way to avoid overfitting, especially if you have more data diversity. Mm. Okay, I, I, I don't have enough background to correctly analyze these figures, I think. Um, but I think they said seven was what they were looking for. Wow. So they're combining, comparing the simulation of generated data versus the training data and training data versus the training data. Left image is generation, right image is closest match. Those are, 
They look very similar. And then here are some examples for stable diffusion specifically. Uh, selected stable diffusion generations using caption sampled from Lion images. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay, so what they're basically saying here is they got the captions from a specific Lion image, and then uh, they generated, they used that to generate an image, and then they found the closest matching image in the Lion data set. And the matching image did not have a lot of overlap necessarily with a source image, but it had a lot of some visual similarity uh, using their, their measure, right? Like there is uh, the same object in the same place with potentially small uh, perturbations. That's a... Uh... Yep, that's um. Uh, Alexi says it would be interesting to calibrate the model with similar natural images. I'm pretty sure there are somewhere two random images which look exactly the same. Um, no. Uh, figure eight, stable diffusion di replicates pixel level details, structures, and styles of well-known paintings. Uh, so some various examples of that. Uh, this one at the bottom here with uh, uh, the sun rising over the shipyards on the water is, I believe, the painting that gave Impressionism its name. It's called something like Impression of Sunset or something. Um, so they're showing like the the general style is the same, the composition is the same, uh, down to the, you know, individual pixel level um, images. Uh, and then just a bunch more examples of, of generated images that look extremely similar to uh, specific images from the training data. Yep. Anyway, uh, so again, I am not, you know, uh, uh, the person to turn to for information on computer vision necessarily. Again, it's not my main uh, area, but they're one of the arguments that people who are claiming that, you know, um, stable diffusion is not copying work is that are using is the claim that they don't copy work. Um, this suggests that, uh, that may not necessarily be the case. Uh, I'll pop the link in the chat if anyone is interested in reading more. And I think, you know, just very good to know uh, as discussions of uh, stable diffusion and uh, computer generated images continue. Uh, Robbie says, generated ML is in trends, I think. I don't know what you mean there, like Twitter trends? Anyway, uh, so here we have uh, the next thing. So this is from the book uh, Economies of Virtue and AI, uh, and this is page 140, uh, Open Secrets, an interview with Meredith Whitaker, interviewed by Jason Sadowski and Thao Fan. Uh, so... I'm just going to sort of uh, scroll down a little bit. We're talking about her, her work history. Uh, she worked at Google for 13 years. Um, continuing to scroll down. Uh, how did I choose linguistics NLP as my main passion? I mean, I don't know that I would necessarily say it's my main passion, it's certainly something I'm interested in. I've always been interested in language. Uh, it's something that I find, I don't know, just fascinating, right? And you know, I think a lot of you are, are in that bucket as well, judging by the discussions that we have on the channel. Um, but I've also, you know, 
really enjoyed math. I was on the math team in middle school. Um, I really enjoyed um, thinking in a, in a sort of formal way about things. Uh, and linguistics combined those two. Um, and I really enjoy doing linguistics. I really enjoy asking questions about literature. Uh, but also, um, I needed to eat food and pay rent. Uh, and most of the jobs in linguistics are in computational linguistics. And, you know, I didn't dislike programming, so uh, I, I went that direction, and here I am. Yep. Uh, let's start reading here. So uh, Meredith Whitaker is particularly well known for, I think she was fired. I don't know if she fired or quit, but she was very well known as a labor organizer at Google. Uh, what other fields did I consider? Um, I mean, I've, you know, in my fair time, read in, in a number of fields that I'm particularly interested in. Um, I like archaeology. I was really interested in theater. Um, I really enjoyed, um, you know, literature. So I, my, my undergraduate degree is actually in English literature and linguistics. I, I double majored. Um, I like math. And then in high school, um, we didn't have, um, like upper level math taught in person. It was in the computer lab. Uh, and that was much more difficult for me to learn from. So I sort of fell off of math, but I think if I had continued to gotten, you know, good, interesting instruction from an actual human being, I probably also have been interested in math. Um, so yeah, lots of things. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we're just talking about inflection points while working at Google. Uh, there are a number of inflection points. I had an English literature and rhetoric degree, which I was drawn to because that's where the cool kids were at Berkeley. I didn't understand everything I was exposed to there, but there was an affective draw, like the weirdos are over there and I love them. I'll read this. Uh, that doesn't make sense because I'm going to do it in a community with people who seem kind and strange and cool. This was in the early 2000s. Post-structuralism is coursing through the veins of academia, uh, and they're still taking psychoanalysis seri seriously, and I'm thrown in with barely a map, reading Lakin, I think, and wondering if I even know how to read anymore. I'm so confused. I'm like a child. So I had a lot of exposure to ways of thinking structurally about power, but those approaches had no tangible referent in my daily life at the time. I think it was actually those ideas that later became the tools for grappling, grappling with for what I was experiencing at Google. I think it was there that I started to read I started returning to Foucault, to Marxist theory, to early anarchist thinkers who weren't taught in college, but who I was familiar with, and suddenly uh, feeling it light up in me as I began to recognize the ways that power was operating. Uh, developing an analysis I felt comfortable with about Google and tech was a long agnostic process, and it's ongoing, but I think I was assisted in this task because I already had a critical inclination, and also because I didn't go through the traditional CS degree training. I wasn't the right gender, I didn't come from the right class, I'm not familiar with the ceremonies that take place in corporate workplaces that mark someone's belonging, so I'm persistently struggling with feelings of alienation, and I'm not necessarily asking uh, questions about things that others take as received wisdom. Uh, this helped place a prophylactic layer between me and the cooler. Uh, who is my favorite mathematician then? I don't know that I have one. I guess um, Hypatia, who's a mathematician? Um, I didn't know what a server was when I started. I knew nothing about computational tech, and uh, as I did with the promises that were made by the company as a whole, I took a lot of things at face value, like the claim that Google, quote, organized all the world's information. Okay, cool, everyone's sounding along. This must be a thing that Google does. But then in trying to understand what I figured everyone else knew, I would ask a really stupid question like, what's information? And then, as often as not, a gaping hole would appear as I processed the fact that information meant content formulated, format in HTML and accessible to a web crawler. I would spin out those questions and revelations. They're like worry beads. But there wasn't an intellectual community I could do that with, so I was isolated and halting, and to handle it, I read a lot. When I learned uh, that a thing called science and technology studies existed, uh, I genuinely almost cried. I had been looking for people to talk to for so long. Um, yeah, which is not trying to think about things without a community. Uh, it's definitely possible, right? But definitely more challenging, and certainly not in the tradition of uh, Western scientific thought. Uh, yeah. 
uh, talking about uh, specifically tech work as a calling. Uh, I think in the tech sector and academia, both raise them up, they use themselves up. Like these are not jobs, these are callings and you need to love what you do and you need to be devoted with what you do. Uh, then the flip side that nobody ever says is like, yeah, well, it doesn't love you back and it's not devoted to you back. But I think the idea of being a vocation as not being a job also prevents a lot of people from being that internal critic of their profession or asking those kind of questions. I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about the radicality of recognizing this as a job, but also the kind of absence of that consciousness in the professions that we work in. And this is something that we've talked about on the channel quite a bit, right? Like, what does it mean to be in a profession? Um, and also the fact that you don't have to like, make it your whole life to, to work in technology. Like I, there's, I have a full rich life and some of it is related to technology and a lot of it is not. Uh, and then Meredith, I think about this a lot because obviously my life art at Google concluded with a devotion to labor organizing and interrogation of the question of who is a tech worker, what is tech work, uh, what the F are we doing? And I think this question points to that need for more interrogation of the way that those institutions are able to hijack or shape our senses of self, our sense of belonging, and our sense for community and sociality and channel those into demands for almost familial loyalty. Uh, what is at stake for people if they don't view a fancy professional title as a calling or identity? What do they lose if they treat it as a job, the way I treated my dishwashing or retail gigs? What do they lose? It's, this is true in academia and tech. When I talk to academics, which is the milieu I'm in now, uh, the profession-based self-regard is very, very similar to tech. Uh, to me, what is so radical and genuinely enjoyable about organizing is the process of breaking down these emotional connections to your employer, to the job, and redirecting this affection, this loyalty to the people around you. This is the process of making solidarity, and solidarity exists when you identify yourself more with who you love and your bonds together than you place in an institutional hierarchy. Um, and I mean, I think we've seen in tech recently that um, uh, placing too much trust in an institutional hierarchy when those institutions are at the whim of people with power and money and very little qualms about hurting people. Um, oh. oh no, I don't know if you heard that, but I think he's a hungry boy. I know we got, I gotta, I gotta wrap up. Um, yeah, uh, so I think I'll just read this paragraph and then uh, put the link to this in the chat if you'd like to read it. But I think Meredith makes a lot of really good points and obviously a person who has, uh, you know, <laughs> done a lot of labor organizing and also sacrificed a lot for her labor organizing. So uh, I think the process needs to start with recognizing that these are jobs. If they pay you, they ultimately get to tell you what to do, however many layers of obfuscation that power relationship may be shrouded in. No one actually forgets who pays them ever. And getting a prize in your job, whether it's an NSF grant or a promotion or tenure, doesn't mean you're a better person. It means you're pleasing those with power over you. Putting it this way cuts the knees of what, <laughs> of getting A's for a living. What a way to talk about academia. I mean, she's not wrong. So I will leave you uh, to read the uh, uh, chat. I'll leave you to leave it uh, to the link of the chat if you're interested in more. Uh, uh, I don't think that's uh, allow that message. All right, and then the final thing, because uh, there's a very sad, very hungry dog making big puppy dog eyes at me because he is so sad and hungry. So this is a thesis, which means we are not gonna read the whole thing, uh, but let's download this PDF. What if you opened it? There we go. Um, wait. Oh, I see, I see. BA and MA at the University of Haifa and then PhD at the University of British Columbia. Okay. So in Canada, as in uh, most of Europe, my impression is uh, that generally you get your master's degree and then you go somewhere else and finish your PhD. In the US, usually you'll get your master's and PhD at the same place. That's what I did. Uh, yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, so let's... A lay summary, thank you. Uh, lay in this case meaning non-expert. Uh, so in ling languages, meaningful linguistic units consist of meaningless distinctive units, e.g. the word cat is composed of three distinct sounds, kat, none of which contribute a meaning compositionally to the word cat. Uh, and as we read uh, last, um, uh, 
last Tuesday, some particularly, um, you know, there may be a small degree of influence that is not necessarily directly iconic, but is has a relationship uh, to meaning between sounds and words. Sound symbolism, people will sometimes talk about it with, um, but it's not super robust cross-linguistically uh, and seems to have the most influence in linguistic play. Um, and the evidence that they, provo- that they provided about swearing and sound iconicity, I found uncompelling. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, in this dissertation, I ask how this, pro- how this property could have emerged phylogenetically. Uh, so Rahu says, hello, uh, what is this? Uh, so we are right now, this is the last paper we're going to read today. This is actually a thesis, um, and it is embody and immersion phonology in the visual manual modality factors, enabling sublexical competition, compensation, putting things togetherness by, uh, Oskana Chakman, perhaps. Uh, and we are just reading a summary. Uh, phylogenetically, in a way that relates to the evolutionary development and diversification of a species or group of organisms. And I am guessing that this is probably, in this case, uh, not actually... Oh, perhaps it is. Um, So I'm trying to figure out if they are talking about phylogenetics here, like straight up biology of humans, or if they are talking... I know you're hungry, bud. Or if they're talking about the relationship of languages to each other, uh, because when you talk about genetics and language, you could be talking about like the genetics of humans, or you can be talking about the relationships of languages to one another, right? So we would say that uh, Latin has child languages of French, Italian, Portuguese, etc., and that those are sister languages to each other. Uh, and you'll talk about family trees and language families. So there's a, an extended metaphor of languages as being familially related to. Uh, Silver says, says, who am I reading to? Am I the only listener? <laughs> I hear you, buddy. I know you're so hungry. Um, well, I'm simultaneously sweet streaming on both Twitch and YouTube, so uh, there's folks in both places. <laughs> Why am I reading aloud to myself? Uh, I'm reading aloud with everyone watching. Hello, and also people listening to the podcast and catching the replay. Uh, and the reason is because uh, I wanted to read this dissertation, and uh, every Tuesday except for next week, because I'm taking that week off. Um, I set aside a time to read the research papers I wanted to read uh, this week with everybody, so we can all do it together and learn together. I don't know if you can hear the pew sound, but that is my dog. Uh, I am plopped the embodied condition, cognition framework, uh, which argues that cognition is embodied. Uh, That is, cognition is not an abstract system that manipulates arbitrary systems via amodal combinatorial rules, but instead a type of adaptive behavior which emerges from the interaction of the biomechanics of the physical body with the environment. So we've talked about embodied cognition very briefly before. It's something I've read in a little bit. It's not something I've ever worked in. Um, Who's on your committee? Brian on your committee? Let's see. Carla Hudson, Douglas Pulleybank, Brian, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to say Brian Jick uh, from UBC is quite well known for doing um, embodied cognition work, particularly in articulation. So I would be shocked if he hadn't been on the committee. Uh, but the supervisor is Carla Hudson Cam, who I don't think I know. If, if we've met, it's been very briefly. Um, so, um, yes, Brian Jick works in embodied cognition. And basically, um, it's that we think because we are humans with human bodies and that that is necessary to the process of cognition, right? So it's sort of um, the the antithesis of a Descartian dualistic um, mind-body complete separation, you can be a brain in a jar sort of stance um, that some people may have. <laughs> uh, yes, he is, a, he is a hungry boy. 
Uh, Silver Rock Cool says, are all these big words necessary or do they sometimes use some of them just to sound more academic and uh, impressive? So in the case of academic research and writing, big words are used because they are specific and they have a specific meaning. So embodied cognition is a particular theoretical framework. A framework is um, a set of thoughts and ideas used to construct theories and test them. Um, so each of these these terms has a very, very specific meaning, uh, and in general, the language in academic writing is more specific than it would be in, in other domains. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically rejecting the idea that there's a mind and a body and, you know, the brain is computer might be another way of thinking about this. Um, rejecting this idea that the brain is a computer and being like, no, 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 we have thought and we have, you know, the, the process of doing cognition because we are have human bodies and that is important um which emerges from the interaction of the biomechanics brian jake does biomechanics of the physical body with the environment i uh, explore the rule of iconicity and kinematics as contributing phylogenetically to the emergence of the inventory of meaningful sublexical segments that are used to create communicative signs uh so here um iconicity the form and the meaning having a direct relationship to each other right so uh counting on your fingers one two three is an iconic thing because each finger represents a specific thing the words one two and three are not iconic they don't have a direct representation of the concepts of one two and three the chinese characters for one, two, and three are iconic, right? One is a single line, two is two lines, and three is three lines because each line represents a number, right? So there's an iconic relationship there. Uh, and kinematics uh, movement as contributing phylogenetically to the emergence of an inventory of meaningful sublexical segments used to create communicative signs. This is a little bit chewy. I would say this is not the like most streamlined possible prose, but there it is. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm probably just going to pick one chapter to skim because if I don't uh, feed my dog, he will revolt. Uh, also, it's been it's been a couple hours. I'm getting tired. So uh, I think so the thing that I was particularly interested in in graduate school was, and there wasn't a lot of work on, was the process of a gesture becoming linguistic. So moving from that purely iconic realm into a linguistic way, and how do we add these, you know, compositional grammatical elements to it? Uh, and I think... Page 36 is probably going to be the best place to start here. Um, Lexi says, uh, the thing which produces adrenaline is located somewhere around our kidneys. As far as I know, it affects our perception and decision making a lot. Yeah, definitely. Um, or like serotonin, right, is produced in the gut. <laughs> you need it for feeling happy. Um, yes. Which, like I said, I think it's a, it's a, it's a feel... It's a way of thinking about thinking that appeals to me, both as someone who is really focused on the body and anatomy in, in my graduate work. Uh, uh, I love how you translate into layman speak. Oh, thank you. That's part of the, the utility of the, the stream, right? Um, it appeals to me both as someone who is really interested in, you know, what the limits are of expressing linguistic grammaticality with the body. Um, but also, I think I've mentioned this before, I'm, I'm a certified personal trainer, um, or I have a personal trainer certificate. I need to, to go and sit it in a fancier room to, to add the CPT title. Um, but, uh, Robbie says, machine learning didn't exist in 2012. Machine learning listed, existed in the 60s, my dude. <laughs> it has been around for a while. <laughs> Things did not start with the Transformer paper, uh, despite what people may lead you to believe. Um, yeah, but it, it, as someone who's really interested in the human body and in the experience of having a body and, and using it and understanding it, um, again, it appeals to me because it sort of synthesizes two things that I'm interested in. Uh... Yeah, actually, I'm trying to pick like one thing out of here, but it's like opening a box of chocolates and trying to pick like the one chocolate that you are particularly interested in. Uh, oh, so many of these are so good. Um, 
because this is really focused on sign languages as well, which is something that I am particularly, uh, again, worked on in, in graduate school. Um, movement repetition patterns. Uh, let's just read this bit from the chat, the conclusion, the body and phonological emergence, because that's what I was particularly interested in. So the difference between phonetics and phonology, phonetics is, um, we said 208, right? Yeah, here we go. So phonetics is speech sounds, right? But not the system of speech sounds and how they relate to each other. So it'll be things like acoustics and articulation and um, very fine grained explorations of that. Um, the phonetics of sign is question mark. It's kind of not something people really talk about, but it could be like, you know, direction, fine grain uh, descriptions of, of movements. Um, I know a lot of people were working with connects, like the, the Xbox thing when I was when I was working with this in the you know, 2020s, 2010s. Um, so, you yeah. uh. Yeah, uh, Lexi says, long-term synaptic plasticity has a lot of epigenetical mechanisms which can be influenced by anything. Uh, what's personal training? Oh, um, like for, for fitness. <laughs> uh, like, um, you know, fitness training, physical training, yep. Uh, do chess engines use machine learning? Uh, I don't know. I know that people have worked on chess in machine learning quite a bit, usually using some sort of reinforcement uh, paradigm like AlphaGo, um, but I don't know what chess engines today use. Yeah, is machine learning related to how my smart TV recognizes what I say? Uh, it probably uses automatic speech recognition, which these days usually does incorporate some sort of machine learning. Mm, always, mm, yeah, it's usually been at least a little bit stochastic. So I would say like it's always incorporated machine learning actually, uh, including language models, the original, original flavor. <laughs> All right. Uh, the body and phonological emergence. We're probably just gonna read just like a little bit of this. Oh, I really wanna read this whole uh, dissertation. This is really interesting. It draws together a lot of thoughts, threads that I'm particularly interested in. Um, the human body is immensely complex, which results in what researchers of biomechanics call the problems of redundancy. There are multiple solutions to any task, such that there is no one straightforward optimal way of doing anything, at least no one optimal way that generalizes across all possible contexts or starting points. A great example of this from articulatory phonetics is there are two ways to produce the R sound. Um, so er or er, they sound identical. In one of them, the tongue body is bunched up or a bunched R, in the other, the tongue body, uh, the tip of the tongue is lifted uh, or a retroflex R. I, having done images studies on myself, I tend to do a met retroflex R. Most people tend to do a bunched R. Uh, but well, there's two ways of doing things, right? And they are uh, acoustically, perceptually, exactly the same. So you just sort of pick one at some point in your life and keep doing that forever. Uh, yeah. Uh, Alexi says, I feel like I'm getting in late in the beginnings of the golden age of machine learning in 2012. Uh, what year did I start? Hmm. I mean, I started in statistics, right? So I probably took my first statistics class 2011, 2010, uh, in undergrad, uh, and then learned more and more because I needed to do, to do analysis. So I think the first time I installed R would have been like 2010, but, but I wasn't in machine learning. I was in statistics because I, I was using it for analysis. Uh, thus, the question is how the central nervous system selects one solution among many comparably good ones for every individual task in every individual context. Some researchers spend decades trying to define the set of criteria that the central nervous system presumably uses to find unique solutions for every action. However, it has been gradually recognized that bodies do not function in uniquely optimal ways. <laughs> you can say that again. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of personal training, every time they perform an action. Instead, each action has multiple adequate, though not necessarily perfect solutions, which will result in desired outcome without exerting too much computational and biomechanical effort required for the perfect solution. What recent research suggests is the body underwrites under a principle of abundance, the central nervous system employs any solution from a family of comparatively equal solutions. And I think this is a little bit beside what I've read deeply in, but I think this is where the motor program stuff comes in. So. Uh, our neural networks, I'm assuming you mean neural with an N, networks and machine learning related. Uh, so neural networks are a, um, a type of machine learning approach. Uh, there are multiple different ways of doing machine learning. Neural networks are one of them. 
Uh, take, for instance, the principle of minimal interaction. The idea that action requires an interaction of multiple elements. The system strives to minimize the interaction of each element with other elements or each element's environment, and in doing so, minimize the amount of input each element receives from them. Building on the principle of minimal interaction, uh, Gelfand and Latash later proposed the principle of abundance by refocusing interpretation of the few-to-many issue, that is, where multiple solutions exist for each task, from being a problem to being a luxury. By choosing any of the available good enough solutions, uh, this is the very, this very much feels like, uh, you know, the sort of guessy stochastic approach we tend to take in machine learning. The body can achieve stable performance of the task even while performing other tasks while having different starting positions and while responding to different perturbations from the environment. That is, instead of wasting resources on computing the perfect solution for each unique situation, choosing any of the available good enough solutions that would do the trick good enough but non-perfect manner allows the central nervous system to achieve its goals with a minimum amount of resources spent on processing input and generating output. Right, so like another example of that is like, if I'm just like picking up and touching something, I don't provide exactly enough touch, uh, exactly enough force to stop exactly the thing I'm touching. Generally, I'll provide enough force to get there and then a bit more. Uh, it's not super accurate, right? Like if this was in fact not solid, I'd probably go through it uh, if I was just trying to touch it. Uh, language, both signed and spoken, is produced by the body, and therefore we should expect that what is true of bodily movements in general is also true of language-related bodily movements. Um, this is one of Brian Jick's big things. And you know what? I tend to agree, right? Um, I think the computer is metaphor, the brain is computer, body is robot metaphor has um, kind of, I don't know. I don't think it's the most helpful way for thinking about language, right? Uh, the fact we know from phonetic research that people neither produce linguistic units consistently, nor do they produce them optimally. The individual tokens of signs can vary widely depending on the environment, register, and many other factors. Oh, this is Melissa's paper. We've just read one of her papers earlier in the stream. Uh, we know that language is under the double pressure of achieving successful communication by being easily perceived by the, perceived by the addressee while not being too difficult to produce for the speaker slash signer. Um, so I like to call this clearness and laziness, right? You want to do the least effort possible, but for the best possible perceptions, so you're not just constantly repeating yourself or worse, they don't understand what you're saying, but you don't have indication of that. So, uh, uh, Solar says, doesn't this field need expertise in both computer science and biology? So this is not a machine learning paper. Uh, this is a human learning paper. Um, who would have that? Lots of people. Yeah, interdisciplinary, this is definitely a thing. Uh, Thus, the production of a linguistic unit does not require a unique, optimal solution for every communication situation, uh, but instead can rely on a family of good enough productions that are similar enough for the perceiver to recognize. So in the like 60s and 70s, there was like, this idea in linguistics that there were invariant units, that something would be repeated exactly every time, which I think comes in no small part from the fact that most linguists are hyperliterate because we grew up in literate societies. Um, so we're used to the idea of compositionality in a writing system where one type day is pretty much exactly like a second type day in the same typeface. Um, but, you know, decades of phonetic research has said there's nothing invariant in the speech signal, right? There's nothing about the word cat that is always going to look exactly the same. We just write it exactly the same because that's our percept, but that is not true in the articulatory process. Or the, or the acoustics, honestly. Hence where cues come in, right? Like things that you might pick up with stochastically if you get enough of them pointing in the right direction. We talked about cues earlier in the stream as well. Uh, oh, I really want to keep reading this, but I do need to wrap up. Uh, three more paragraphs. One more page. One more page. <laughs> um, so how does this happen? Uh, signs can be coined with articulatorily easy routines and their form may be further modified to ease articulation as being used in interaction. So an example of that would be in American Sign Language, the sign for bus is the B-U-S, finger spelling, just sort of reduced quite a bit to make it easier. What is easy to articulate, therefore, can be defined in at least two ways. Easy to articulate in isolation, just given how the body is structured and how it is functioned, right? So there's not a lot of signs that like isolate the, the ring finger because that's a very hard finger to isolate. It has, you know, attachments to other fingers and it's hard to move on its own. <laughs> Alexi says, cat, 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 yep. Um, 
In this dissertation, I focused exclusively on isolated signs as they are listed in sign language dictionaries and online corpora. What I showed in chapter three was that at the stage of sign creation, as can be judged by signs that eventually get conventionalized to the point of being listed in dictionary, the articulatory properties selected for are those that assure some articulatory stability. Um, Articulatory stability here refers to the ability of the articulatory gesture bodily constructed to be replicate to replicate the movement pattern across multiple productions uh, and to restore it in a variety of perturbations, right? So a good example there would be like speaking of touching, like if you have a sign where like two things are touching, right? And that's the thing that you're paying attention to. You don't have to have exactly the amount of force for them to just touch. Um, you don't even necessarily have to have them touch all the way. You can sort of like gesture towards it uh, with a maybe a motion that indicates that. So uh, body anchored signs where you're physically touching your body again, like as a place to, to end up with. Um, if the sign is produced with body contact, then putting more energy or increasing the speed of signing are not going to change its form because the body part it makes contact with will stop the movement and result in no overshoot, like I was talking about with touching objects in the world. Which means the body contact is one example of a good enough solution. The variability of productions will still result in a stable output. The stability is exploited in first language acquisition, in second language acquisition, in morphological processes, and results in resistance to diachronic change. See chapter three for an overview. Um, so basically, the fact that we have bodies and uh, that our bodies are just sort of picking the good enough solution, not necessarily always calculating the exact, the one single perfect best solution in the situation, because that would be way too computationally expensive and we already spend most of our calories on our brains to begin with. Um, the the point there is that they are going to use articulatory strategies that are easier to make the articulation um, and also easier to, to perceptually understand visually. So, uh, hey, Kira Sira, uh, I'm actually going to wrap up right now because I want to eat and also my dog needs to. So. Uh, I'll place the link to this uh, dissertation in the chat if you're interested in reading more. I We might actually come back to this next week or two weeks from now. I'm going to take a week off because um, there's a lot in this dissertation that is really like, a, mm, mm, I really want to read it, right? <laughs> it's sparking my intellectual curiosity. It's making me feel like an undergrad. I want to read more. Uh, <laughs> Lexi says there's some territorial cat dominant struggle happening outside your building. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Silver Hall says, uh, see you later. This is the most unique thing I've seen on Twitch. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, check out the paper maybe. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna wrap it up there. Before I do, I want to say a big thank you to my coffee supporters. I appreciate you all very much. Uh, you help this happen. Um, it means a lot. I, I do. I genuinely appreciate it. And everyone watching, but I, I appreciate my support it's a little bit more. Sorry. Uh, there will be no stream on Thursday. There will be no streams next week. I'm taking some time off, but I think we will be back on, what is it, the second? The third. Uh, my plan is to be back on the third, probably for a paper reading stream. I may do something slightly different. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll put it on, on YouTube and, and my Twitter, which is R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N. Assuming Twitter's still around, then who knows? I might log out of it completely for a little bit because I might need a little bit of a brain break. So, oh, thank you, Docking, and thank you for uh, for showing up and also your support. I appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Thank you so much for joining, everyone. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful break. Um, if you celebrate Gregorian New Year, which I most, most imagine most of you do, have a good New Year. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.